Welcome to the first ISC, International Invasive Species and Climate Change Conference. I'm Tony Lynn Morelli. We were just talking as we were opening up the meeting how this feels like kind of a field of dreams moment as we built something and we hoped people would come and it appears that people are. We've had almost 1,700 people register for this meeting. So that's pretty exciting, especially since it's the first one. So I'm just here to give a little introduction. So I can see your reactions and that's very cool because one of the things we had to do because we had 1600 people is make this a webinar instead of an open meeting where there's a chat. And so I really appreciate and the speakers today will really appreciate any responses you can give through reactions. I think that's a nice way for the group to communicate given that we couldn't keep the line open. Also, you'll notice the Q&A box. That's also a really important piece. We really want to be ha making this a dialogue as much as possible. And as I go through the agenda, you'll see that we built in lots of different kinds of sessions to try to keep it as interactive seeming as we can, again, with the constraints. Use those tools and ask your questions. And you can actually upvote questions so you can say whether you really like that question, let's upvote it. And then actually that could allow us to see it even more if there's lots of questions and, and get that question answered. Okay, so one of the pieces we're trying to do make this a little more interactive is that you can right now go to menti.com and use code 62485442 or this QR code and Tell us where you're from. So there's lots of questions there. I would suggest that you could wait until the break to answer some of the other ones. Some of them are pretty thought provoking. So hopefully you take a little more time. Apparently research says multitasking isn't actually a, a thing that people can accomplish, but I won't stop you if you keep going. Anyway, I'm excited to kind of show you where we're coming from and hope, hope to see a lot of diversity here on the map and throughout the day. I just wanted to introduce the ISC organizing committee. These are the four folks that have worked together over the last six months to bring you this meeting. And it's Giancarlo Seja, who is a student at University of Southern California. He also helps us in general as a virtual student federal service intern with the Regional Invasive Species and Climate Change Risk Management Network. You'll be hearing a lot about risk throughout the day. Dee Lawrence is faculty at Penn State University and in the leadership of the Northeast Risk. Myself, I'm with the U.S. Geological Survey at the Northeast Climate Adaptation Science Center and helped found the Risk Network. And Elliot Parsons is with the Pacific Risk and the Pacific Islands Climate Adaptation Science Center. So, the risks. So we've mentioned the risks again. I've already mentioned a bunch of times you probably noticed in the emails and announcements you got. So the risk network, we have six risks around the continent and the country, and you can see them here, including Canada. And we really came together. So this uh, meeting is supported by the risk networks and membership and leadership in the risks that really thinks about how do we improve action on the ground and research as we deal with these twin global change stressors. We also have had wonderful partners that have supported this meeting. And so you can see those here. We're really grateful to all of the people that have helped us through this meeting. And I'm gonna actually hand this over to one of them, Christy Milhouse from NASMA, to say a few words. Thank you so much, Tony. Greetings and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. I am Christy Trifone Milhouse, and I serve as the Executive Director for the North American Invasive Species Management Association, referred to as NASMA. We're a vibrant and growing nonprofit working to empower invasive species management in North America. And we do this by providing the connections, the tools, and the voice needed to address the threats of invasive species. We know that this is not a mission for the faint of heart and that collaboration across all taxa and all sectors is required to gain traction and to begin to move the needle forward towards success stories that respond to our ever-changing environment. We are honored to be the event host for this important international event that is bringing together researchers and managers from across the globe 
to share their experiences with managing biological invasion in the wake of climate change. These issues impact us all. And this event provides a unique venue for us to come together to share our stories and lessons learned so that we may be more prepared for what is ahead. I would like to take a moment to thank your organizing committee, as well as all of the presenters. This inaugural event would not have been possible without all of you. I challenge each of you over the course of the next two days to find a presentation that inspires you to take a next step in your own work and in your own community. Thank you again for joining us. And now back to you, Tony. Thanks, Christy. That's great. And we'll see if maybe one of my co-leads can uh, pin my um, image again. So I wanted to just share the mission of RISC to tell you a little more about RISC that you'll hear about throughout the next two days. The RISC management networks reduce the joint effects of climate change and invasive species by synthesizing relevant science, sharing the needs and knowledge of managers, building stronger scientist manager communities, and conducting priority research. I think those are things you're also interested in, and that's why you're here, I hope. And so hopefully, if those are things that you're interested in, we'll help you meet some of those objectives in the coming days. We've been really busy at the risks, so we just finished this year in review, and you can see all of our great stats that we've accomplished across the six risk networks that we have in the US and Canada. Thanks to Giancarlo Seha for putting this together. We've been holding conference um, sessions at NASMA, the North American Invasive Species Management Agency. We've produced research summaries. You'll be hearing about those throughout the day. We've had over 4,000 participants in our events. And then, as I mentioned, we've had almost 1,700 people register for this meeting today. So you might be sitting in your office or standing in your kitchen as I am, but you're not actually alone. You're in a big community of people that care about these topics too. And we're hoping that you can make connections over the next two days. Speaking of which, so here's our schedule. Here at the top, this is me. This is the part I'm taking on. And then in a little bit, we'll be introducing our keynote and then our plenary. We'll have a little break uh, and then we'll go into our first talk session. So we really tried to make things varied, both in terms of the structure of sessions and also the topics. So you can see we start off with new arrivals, maybe appropriately. And then we go into a session, a panel on managing invasive species in a changing climate, where we hear from a variety of experts. And we'll close out the day with a community action award, which we're really excited about. And then some closing remarks from my co-organizer, Elliot Parsons. So again, throughout the day, use the Q&A, use the chat. And at the very end of the meeting, we'll have a survey. This is the first inaugural ISC. We're really looking for feedback. So keep that in mind as you're going through the day. What did you really like? What do you wish had been different? We can think about addressing those things next year. Or maybe you want to be on the organizing committee next year so you can volunteer. So with that, I'm very happy to introduce our first speaker, our keynote speaker, Dr. Jennifer Grentz. Dr. Gruntz is an assistant professor in the Department of Forest Resources Management at the University of British Columbia. She has a Bachelor's of Science in Agroecology and a PhD in Integrated Studies in Land and Food Systems, both from UBC. Jen's research focuses on applying an indigenous worldview, she's Nalaka Pamux of mixed ancestry, to invasion biology and ecology and challenges us to think differently about our role in ecosystems management as we face a rapidly changing climate. She is passionate about bridging the practitioner researcher divide as she worked for nearly two decades providing consulting services and on the ground management of invasive species for all levels of government prior to it at her academic appointment. Her lab the Indigenous Ecology Lab is currently working on understanding the impacts of invasive plants and soil microbial ecology and the role of these impacts on post eradication restoration activities. So I think you can see why we chose her as our keynote speaker and just so glad to have you here, Dr. Grentz. And so I will stop sharing and, and let you share your insight and perspective and expertise with us.
Um, good morning, everyone, and um, thank you so much for inviting me uh, today. Um, it's kind of a full circle moment for me, and I'm really happy to see this field of dreams uh, experience for you all. Um, I was very, very involved with NASMA um, up until probably about eight years ago, um, you know, when it moved to all taxa and um, even that logo, <laughs> I helped design that. Um, so anyways, it's just, it feels like coming home again and I'm so happy to be able to share with you all this morning and I titled my talk taking teachings from our targets how storytelling will help shape invasion biology in a changing climate so I hope you're all open to becoming storytellers alongside me just a quick refresher on who I am. I always say I identify as a field practitioner, even though I've sort of infiltrated the academy now. I've spent 20 years on the ground managing invasive species in different capacities, seriously the best work in the world. And now I have managed to wiggle my way into life at the University of British Columbia to go back and address some of those things I had to walk past as a field practitioner where you're like, hmm, that's kind of interesting. I wonder why that's happening. So now I have such a privilege to be able to try and figure out what was happening and take all of what I've learned as a practitioner and seen on the ground and the wonderful connections I continue to have with those on the ground. I see them in the audience, especially the Regional Invasive Species Committees in British Columbia. So it's just great to, to be able to have this vantage point now. This is the shameless plug for my lab. Our lab works entirely in service to Indigenous communities within so-called British Columbia, working towards land healing and food systems revitalization projects. And those are not just on tribal lands, but also on crown lands as well. So we're bringing local and indigenous knowledges um, into the work that we're doing. So I think that anyone who manages plants in some way for many years has noticed the impacts of climate change for a long time. And there were many discussions that I had to sit through with the classic uncle, you know, climate denialist. Um, and always felt like I was experiencing firsthand changes in climate just through my everyday job. And in reflecting upon those days, think that a lot of what I noticed over the years as I was managing plants is I would sort of react with, well, that's weird. And, you know, carry on my way. And thinking back, I recognized that there were many different iterations of that's weird, like oh, it's just a really nice spring. That's why there's not much rain. You know, it's a drought year. It was a 200 year flood. It was a 100 year flood. You know, this is just a bad wildfire year. You know, we have an isolated patch of this species on the coast, but these plants belong in the in warm interior climate. They're not gonna establish. It's too wet here for this particular species that we found. You know, and then things even as simple as like, well, I've never seen scotch broom flower twice in a year before. And then this year, three times in a year before, or I wouldn't expect to see this species at this elevation must be an isolated incident for sure. And then I reflect also even on how we managed our crews and scheduling their work. I was the executive director of the Invasive Species Council of Metro Vancouver, and when we would schedule our crews, they worked in the Metro Vancouver region in a rainforest. And so managing for those weeks where there was rain, like what is the crew going to do while well, it's pouring rain for weeks on end? That changed over a decade where we were no longer managing around rain, but in fact we're managing around it being too hot to do the management that we needed to do. And we started to experience things like this, where suddenly access to forest service roads and areas within forestry operations were shut um, because the risk was too high. It was too hot. The humidity in the rainforest was too low making the extreme fire hazards. And in fact, I will tell you, I actually cried in front of this gate because it gets very wary. This is happening in real time to all of us. And within my career, which is starting to maybe look a little bit longer, it's really not that long. And I started to think, when are we gonna actually be able to manage these plants? 
So we, we can't do it when it rains or it's flooding. We can't do it even during wildfire season because it's too smoky and it's not healthy for our crews to be out in, in terrible air quality. And then all the roads are closed because of extreme fire hazard. But fear not. Uh, field season is much longer than it used to be. It used to be in the early part of my career where I live from May until October and not even far into October, you know, just when first frost hit. My last season running cruise, which was in 2022, our field season was from the end of February until December the 1st. And that's over a decade and a half in terms of change. And also other things that happen too, is that where we would visit one site, you know, or uh, visit a site once per year, do a treatment and that was it. Then it became two times a year. Now it's three times a year because if plants are coming back, they have the opportunity uh, to do that. And so uh, after I finished my PhD, I started to work on, and, and during my PhD, I started to work on applying a more relational worldview to invasion biology and to tend to a lot of the self-doubt that I felt as a manager experiencing all of these really significant changes on the landscape. It really became clear to me that we needed to remove the hyperfixation on the target, something that I've talked about elsewhere, if you've heard me speak before, and recognizing that this sort of Eltonian lens that I had been using in management and in outreach maybe wasn't serving us as well and maybe was inhibiting our ability to be more effective in our management. Because really, it just has increasingly felt a little bit more like a fancy game of whack-a-mole. <laughs> and I just really believe that we can do better and that we maybe need to alter our perspective in order to do that. And so as I spent more time with Indigenous elders, land guardians, people who are of the land and listened to their stories and listened to their deep knowledges of their lands and plants and soils. And as I was reconnecting myself as an Inglacatmic woman, I learned about different types of storytelling. And there was one that really intrigued me. It's the stories that are meant to teach us the grand life lessons, lessons about not being selfish, about stewarding land, about the risks of greed, about the importance of caring for others. And what I learned from my elders and others was that the, these stories are meant to change. They change for the context so that they're relevant to the learner. So how a story about greed was told to my grandmother would be different than how the story would be told to my mother and would be different to how I was told the story. And the reason for that is that so that the story is relevant to the context of the day, right? So that the learner could relate to it and take those teachings forward into the modern world. And this really turned in my mind as I wandered through the forest looking for invasive plants. It made me pay more attention to the context and I removed the target. I started to look up more and I looked around and I inhaled deeply and I touched the trees and the shrubs and the grasses, all of these things that I missed with my targeted laser focus approach at getting the invader, right? Ghostbusters style. And I started to notice that the feeling beneath my feet as I walked in the forest felt different. And for me, walking in the forest, that is home. And where we live in our rainforest, there's this bounce under your feet from the duff layer. It's kind of like walking almost on a gymnastics floor, you know, that springy feet feeling beneath your feet as you walk in the understory. And what I realized was it was gone. My boots were sinking into what felt like powdered sugar. And it made navigating with a heavy backpack sprayer that much more difficult. Suddenly I was not only responsible for like my own weight and the weight of the backpack, but fighting this resistance, this sand like feeling. And I started to realize this was a lot more serious than I even already felt it to be. And that this game of invasive plant whack-a-mole was a symptom 
of a grander problem that we are facing. And that was that we're locked into one story when we're doing management. Um, you know, we're locked into a story that doesn't change to the context. And those stories are called best management practices. And I have helped develop many of these and still use them as a tool. So I'm not writing them off completely, but many of them are old. Many of them are not context specific enough. So often they are applied broadly across very diverse landscapes facing very different climate realities. But you know, cookie cutters are convenient, I get it, right? But we have to find a way to change the story or allow for flexibility in their story that they can help us to be more effective in the way that we're doing management today. I guess the question is, you know, at what point do we alter course and stop limiting ourselves even to the way that we study weeds and invasive species, which is largely limited to studying the plants themselves or studying specific management approaches for specific plants. You know, what are the other characters in the story that we've kind of treated a bit like extras that we don't even pay attention to that maybe we really do need to start making them more of a major player in this movie that we're working within, right? Like, what do the soils tell us? You know, what are the soil microbes tell us? What are uninvaded areas telling us? What are invaded areas telling us? What are the secondarily invading species trying to tell us beyond them just being like, oh, now we've got Himalayan blackberry coming back on the site, but like why, right? I think we really have to recognize that we can't ignore all of these characters. And we know that we're already um, managing species in a very complicated plot, right? There's so many factors to manage, but I think what we have to come to recognize is that the plot is a lot thicker now um, because of climate change. And what do we know about this thickening plot? Well, um, I love this slide so much, <laughs> um, but life finds a way, right? And this is where the plants can outfox us. I just wanted to talk really quickly about some of the published research around the impacts of climate change and in invasive plants, just for a quick refresher to realize what we're up against. And also to point out that a lot of this literature, it's not new. It's been around for a long time. And that was a trend that really caught me off guard because I thought, gosh, when I was managing plants more actively on the ground, why was this not informing what I was doing? Why was this not brought to my attention? And so just a quick refresher, but some of the major impacts of climate change that will have an impact on plants have three focus areas, right? Changes in carbon dioxide, changes in temperature, and changes in precipitation. And we have to realize that assessing the impact of climate change on plant biology is so difficult. I'm sorry, it's a very plant-centric talk, but I do manage other critters as well. But we have compounding environmental factors, changing landscapes, different species may have different responses, different species have different genetics in different places. We have all these compounding variables that we do need to consider. But the bottom line is that the air today is different than the air we're born, and we might not notice, but plants absolutely do. And our CO2 concentrations were relatively stable here on planet Earth for almost 800,000 years, and now we find ourselves at the highest concentration in 14 million years. So things have changed, and the plants are noticing. And this is helping to increase dispersal If things like weed seeds. It's helping some weed species gain competitive advantages, even through things like allelopathy. And we've got differential growth responses to climate change. One example is like Canada thistle is responding to CO2 by increasing the number and size of leaf spines, right? So that's gonna limit herbivory further. It's gonna make it way less fun to bring volunteers out to deal with the plant as well. 
Other impacts like on increased temperature, which we've certainly experienced around here is the expansion of weeds into higher latitudes. And this is where there's like that. That's weird. Why is there a desert type uh, species showing up in our rainforest? And another thing too, is that this is changing also how our plants are flowering, that they're setting buds earlier in the season, that their seed size is larger. There's increased cold tolerance, and it's all resulting in things like this. This is scotch broom that is very, very happy and doing well. Um, you know, more about dispersal. A lot of weed seeds are transported by water and precipitation patterns. And Dr. David Clements and I um, wrote a chapter on climate change and invasive plants, which I can share that publication later, looking at the impacts of the flood events where we live. And this is a picture from November of 2021 on knotweed species and its movement from that. But this is becoming the regular and I'm just, I am not showing you pictures that I grabbed off the internet that aren't from where I am. This is the lands that I work in. The other piece of this also is wildfire. And I see Jackie Rasmussen, who's the executive director of the Lillooet Regional Invasive Species Committee is on here today. And we are working on a project with her in the Lillooet area, along with Statlium Nation, looking at what do you do after this, right? So now we've got moonscape, we've got ash layers deeper than 30 centimeters. We don't know what happens to vegetation trajectories after wildfire, but we do know that suddenly you've got a lot of people vectoring, uh, in their building vector pathways, fire breaks, uh, in and out of roads, and a lot of disturbed land. And we can't forget the effect uh, of changes in precipitation on weeds. And I listed some of those that I'd seen firsthand myself already. Um, but, you know, response to drought conditions, we know that a lot of invasive plant species do better. And also we know that those sorts of conditions make other, say, desirable plant species more susceptible to pathogens or less competitive. And that weed species may actually be able to adapt more quickly to these environmental changes. The piece of this that I'm really interested in, and I think, gosh, you know, maybe some of our lack of successes could be attributed to this, is the impacts of climate change on chemical control programs. Um, we know that increased temperatures have a si significant effect on chemical management and things like drought resulting in thicker cuticle development or increased leaf, uh, leaf pubescent, anything that can basically reduce entry of herbicide uh, into the leaf can be a result of these, you know, increased uh, temperatures. Also just the efficacy of some of the chemistries that we're using when we're working at these higher temperatures can decline as well. Dr. Ditchell Bay from Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada and I are currently working on a research project where we've established that knotweed species are becoming resistant to glyphosate. And we presented about that at the recent Canadian Weed Science Society conference. But it makes me wonder, this is actually what the epinastic growth that we're seeing from not we looks like in a resistant population but you know has climate played a role in this i feel like it has not weed has a much longer season than it did before and has required way more exposure in terms of multiple treatments at each site and this is some of it coming back as well and then we can't leave out biocontrol. In particular, there are a lot of pub publications about the syn synchrony between the development and reproduction of biocontrol agents and their selected targets. The, some of these cycles are changing such that things aren't matching up as well anymore, or other things that we're dealing with, like increased flooding events while we have insects that are overwintering in the soil. So there's a lot against us. I feel like negative, <laughs> but, but there is a lot going on, you know, and we're also starting to see that one of the impacts too is that fast growing perennials might tend to dominate ecosystems in this elevated CO2 environment. And that's certainly something that I've seen firsthand in some of our sites. And then for me, you know, other impacts are that traditional plant species that are particularly important to a number of the indigenous communities that I work with may be more vulnerable to climate change. This applies to a number of rare species, at-risk species, where they have very specialized habitat requirements, narrow environmental tolerances, dependence on very specific environmental triggers, something that my, my lab is actually looking at in a number of species, um, and a poor ability to disperse. So, you know, we have to keep those things in mind because I think also with our target sort of lens, we forget 
what we're working for, <laughs> you know, like what's happening to the species we take for granted that belong. And then to that end, these larger philosophical discussions, like will these invasive species bring new medicines and food sources? What do we actually think about invasive species? I know those are really tough conversations to have, but we have to have them. We have to go there and, and have that level of discussion, especially with a greater specificity within the context. So I guess my question, given all of that, is why does it seem like our programs carry on with the status quo? Why are we okay using the same approaches when in some cases we know that they're not very effective? And I can tell you that just from some of the species that I manage, like knotweed as an example. And I think looking at our field with this climate change lens illuminates the issue of what I you know, believe, and I know many people have talked about, is this incredible disconnect between practitioners and academics. And I can tell you that I have sat in conferences where academics present about some control method that they've tried. And as a practitioner, I have sat and rolled my eyes because there's no way that would work on a landscape level. There's no way we could afford what they're putting out there in terms of how large an infestation is. It's so impractical and like hilarious to do science for the sake of science. And that is not not unusual, I'm sorry to say. Part of the reason why I have infiltrated the academy, I feel like. And then on the other side of that too, we have practitioners, no offense, I was one thinking field trials are sufficient research. They're not. And so I see research contracts going out that are being awarded to non-academic environments. And yes, Field trials can be meaningful and helpful, but we need to be engaging people, you know, like me now that have the time to really dig deep and bring together other people to answer these very complex questions. And so I think really at the end of the day is that when we're telling stories, we need to be telling them together. We need to be writing them together. I just cannot stress enough as seeing the biggest barrier that's in our way to dealing with this issue and managing in this current context is this. So and end rant. <laughs> and I think, you know, a lot of this too is that we need to give ourselves the freedom to get to know our targets and plant communities better. And we need to make sure that we're not letting common scientific criticisms stop us from a necessary paradigm shift. It's okay to am anthropomorphize plants. I talk to plants all the time. I would challenge that there isn't a single person that manages plants that hasn't spoken to a plant at one time, even if you're like, you're going down, baby. You know, I mean, right? Like I smack talk plants all the time when I'm managing them. And I hope that helps. But we really do, if we're, we're creating new stories going forward, we better be talking to our plants, paying attention to them, understanding better what is going on with them. And so I'm going to finish my talk today showing you what this storytelling, talking to the plants has changed and how that is being enacted within my lab. So first of all, I stopped going into the bush by myself. I now bring a whole gaggle of friends, soil scientists, so my pro microbial ecologists, historical ecologists, archaeologists, land guardians, indig like indigenous knowledge keepers, because this is so complicated. Yes, I have a lot of knowledge about plants and invasion biology, but I can't know everything. It's not possible. And you know, there's so much value in like the beginner's mind as well when we work together in interdisciplinary ways that someone might point something out to you that we just get so ingrained in our everyday job that we're not as open to thinking differently. And so this really helps to facilitate that. So first off, I'm not telling stories by myself anymore. I am telling stories stories with other amazing, wonderful storytellers. And this includes farmers and even people that are walking their dogs through the same park for the last 30 years. There's so much knowledge out there that we need to be able to tell a story going forward. And we better have clarity about what that story is going to be. And that's where I got to go back to my dad's baseball, you know, thing all the time when he was coaching me in baseball is like, you got to swing through. 
You got to follow through. And I feel like what we do in invasion biology or in invasive plant management is we're bunting all the time because we're not following through. We're not working on the restoration component of that, but we have to go all the way through or at least have people with us to help us do that. And so for me now, suddenly I'm dabbling in soil microbial ecology and doing a lot more with plant soil interaction. And I'm spending a lot of time learning in uninvaded systems. So we're working right now a lot on the ancient, ancient forest gardens which have completely different species composition and forests. These were plant food systems managed by a number of different nations. And I'm working specifically within British Columbia. It's so interesting or weird that there aren't any invasive species in these. And it's not that they're not near them. And so, you know, I want to learn what are the stories of the soil? What's going on there? Who, what plant relations are there? Is it biodiversity that's helping this? You know, why is it different than the periphery forest? So I'm spending time in places where the story can be informed by healthy ecosystems so that we can come back to the other thing that we have become, you know, are trying to help is in major climate event recovery. And as I mentioned, this is a project with the Lillooet Regional Invasive Species Society where wildfire is not the same as it used to be. Nothing like fire stewardship. These are very, very hot burns where tree mortality is greater than 80%. And there's the hydrophobicity of the soil it goes on much longer than the literature is telling you. I can tell you that right now. We know that now. And trying to understand what plants come back. And is this just now a giant invasion nightmare? So this is also what we're working on now. And then looking at all these complexities like grazing impacts on vegetation after wildfire, because in British Columbia, we've decided that cattle are part of the natural landscape. So what happens when they come through burn areas? And what about the other plants, the desirable plant species? What are the impacts of the vectors coming in and out of these areas? Like how do we start an ecosystem over again? We don't even know. And so also we're working a lot on soil microbial ecology and getting some very interesting results that aren't yet published, but soon will be. But we're finding that invasive plants are changing the stories of the soil. They are having an impact on both fungal and bacterial populations. And interestingly enough, some of these non-mycorrhizal species like knotweed eliminate essential fungal populations that are other native plant species are reliant upon. So, you know, suddenly all these things are starting to make sense of like all the restoration sites I worked on. We eradicate the invasive species. We plant the native species in their place. We pat ourselves on the back. Maybe we pray over them. We water them. We love them and they still die. Well, it looks like the supporting cast that they require is no longer present. And so this is the, a lot of what we're working on right now. And, and I, I look forward to sharing more about that with all of you in the future. And so, you know, this has an impact on what comes back in these sites after the fact, you know, what is the story going forward? So just to wrap up here, we're spending a lot of time learning what do the native plant species need so that we can understand how the story has changed with that invasion, right? So again, we're really spending a lot of time on this kind of swing Swinging, swinging through and what do plants need to thrive and how are the competitors against invasive species like how can we help give them a leg up is it realistic for us to think that they're going to survive through things like you know heat domes and after wildfire and so i just really i want to close with just encouraging you all to become storytellers of a grander story, going beyond that target, you know, pushing the bounds on what are best management practices, not being stuck in the confines of cookie cutters and the way we've always done it. And to be more open to other possibilities. I think a lot of us spend a lot of time having to defend chemical management practices in particular because of a lack of social licensing around uh, those issues that we become even more deeply ingrained and in, like, this is the way to do the management. And it, sometimes it is. 
you know, but I do think we have to make sure that those experiences aren't closing us off from the other possibilities. And so I just want to end by thanking our amazing Indigenous community partners, of which there are many who are co-researchers with us. We are specifically answering research questions that they have asked and the value of spending time with their elders and knowledge keepers who have brought a lot of this to our attention. Let us bring the tools together of what we call the old and new ancestors to answer these complex questions. Thank you so much for having me and I'm happy to answer questions. Fantastic. What a fantastic, inspiring start to our meeting, Dr. Grunts. Thank you. We have lots of questions for you. So <laughs> some of them, we might have you come in and answer specifically in the Q&A. I know you have to run for a bit, but maybe you can come on back this afternoon. There were a lot of questions about the glyphosate resistance that I don't know if you want to just touch on it for a minute or so, and then you could drop some links in the Q&A. Where can we find more inf information on glyphosate resistance and not weed species? Can you share information on glyphosate resistance that you mentioned in a recent meeting, you know, et cetera? <laughs> well, if you were in attendance at the Canadian Weed Science Conference, we would have heard the paper that Dr. Jitchell Bay and I um, presented on. So we're currently doing the genetics work now associated with the um, dose assay studies that we have done. We've looked at, I think it's five different populations now uh, within the lower mainland and Fraser Valley. Something I have been noticing, I will tell you for more than a decade, and again, this was just where also practitioner knowledges are often denigrated and dismissed like, oh, no, just spray it anyways was sort of the message that I got. But we were noticing a significant amount of epinastic growth. And so through the dose assay studies found that indeed they're resistant. We will have a publication coming out soon about that in the Plant Science Journal. I'm not sure if the proceedings yet have come out from the CWS, but there'll definitely be more to come on that. So that's all I can really share at this point. That's great. Thank you. Uh, so thinking a little bit more broadly, Mike Yadrick asks, have you been considering accepting higher thresholds of the pests slash weeds or acknowledging positive contributions of the invasive species that may help balance the traditional impact focused IPM approach? <laughs> Definitely. And this is where I think, you know, the greater level of specificity in terms of how we're doing our management is really important. There have been some invasive species like Himalayan blackberry, it's super widespread in the Pacific Northwest, you know, and we were managing it in more sensitive ecosystems where there's not as much of it. But in some cases, some of the indigenous communities you work with are like, this is a free source of food. You know, it's in disturbed areas. We don't mind it being there. Can you just leave it alone? And if it's spreading into other parts of our lands and we're going to manage it there. So that's an example. There's been some larger discussions too about noticing pollinators on different weed species like spotted knapweed, which has become really extensive on Vancouver Island, but then also people noticing while well, the pollinators seem to like it. Some of those questions I've been farming out to other entomologists, like what's the quality of the pollen? Just asking more of these questions. And there's been a lot of work in that regard, but trying to ensure that anything that we're sort of increasing our tolerance to, that we've answered some important questions there and that we're not sort of oversimplifying our, our assessment on the ground by like, well, well, there's four different species of native pollinators on this, they must like it. Well, is it that there's other things missing, you know, all of that. But yeah, I mean, there's definitely been some philosophical discussions. One example that I like to use is Western red cedar is the key stone species of Coast Salish groups. And that would have been considered an invasive species 5,000 years ago by our risk assessment. Right. So, you know, and like, I, I know that doesn't like work for everything, but I do think that we need to have a little bit more of an epistemic openness and not sort of write anybody off as crazy for like actually going there for a minute and, and thinking about that because we cannot be everywhere and get everything. And I think with climate change, this is making at least where I manage the plants are doing really well and we have to prioritize. Yeah. Super, thank you. Um, Gary Fish makes the point uh, that unfortunately it's been difficult to get the resources to do the minimal level of management, adding all the multidisciplinary levels will make it even more difficult to garner those resources. 
how do you expect to find the funding for a more comprehensive approach? I, I actually think that it's a lot simpler than I even thought to, to begin with, because I had that perspective as well, especially being someone who was on the practitioner side of things for so long was like, we had very limited budgets and we're like, okay, here's our list of, you know, 400 sites and we'll just start working down that list and we can only get to 160 and the money would run out. But what I'm finding is there is a lot of interest in invasive species um, from other researchers who I had never worked with in the past, you know, like soil scientists, as an example, like soil microbial ecologists, as an example. And so I think it's just for me, because we're getting funding that we need to answer some of these questions and using the funding of others because they're ready to pivot or they want to be in a more um, relevant context in the work that they're doing. And I think this is one of the great things about managing invasive species is you can have wins, right? And that feels really good. And you can see the direct impact of your research fairly quickly sometimes. So I think it's just about pitching it to other researchers that are working in similar areas that might then bring those resources. And we're pairing up quite a bit now with like regional invasive species groups and environmental nonprofit organizations that have been doing work on invasive species. But we now have access to this other pot of money in the academic realm, which at least in Canada is quite good. And so, you know, that has bolstered the programs of the people on the ground as well. So I think it's like bringing the pots of money together. But I can't characterize what's happening in the United States or anywhere else in the world. No, that's great. Thank you. All right. Two more questions. One from a fellow speaker. Um, love to hear your thoughts on who gets to decide the value of species. For example, someone who hunts is going to value the introduction of new species like a gazelle to hunt, while others might be more concerned about the impact they have on natural areas. And we're in North America, at least often coming from this kind of traditional Western centered colonial view. Do you have thoughts about that? I think the important piece of the storytelling model is to, if you're working in a specific place, to bring together all of the people that have something to do with that space to try and write the story going forward where you're working in a values based and community needs approach. So that is one way that we deal with that. And I think it's very different than a stakeholder, a multi stakeholder approach where you come into, you know, kind of elbows up and, you know, whoever's got the bigger piece of the pie gets to have the opinion. We've been working in these more relational ways, even within those kinds of contexts with the same characters. And it really changes things because you change the conversation from what are we trying to get to what are we trying to get to what does this look like that then we can also have more community engagement to help us because we do have limited resources and all of that and it, that doesn't work everywhere but i think more often than not there's a lot of common values and agreement on what needs to happen in these spaces excellent and as a follow-up that to that do you have any it suggestions or insight about how non-Indigenous folks can support Indigenous efforts in this realm or towards climate resilience and sustainability? Again, I can only speak from where I'm from and my own relationships, but I think it's really about, again, what are the values and what are the goals? And I think, you know, I'm all about applying a food systems lens to the landscape because their food's not just for people, but also for all relations. And it's not just indigenous people. Where I'm from, most people are filling their freezers with protein sources from the natural environment. And so I think if we apply that food systems lens, I think that helps us to work in a way to make sure that those kinds of things are taken care of. And I cannot tell you how valuable it has been to be working directly with the communities whose lands those are to understand the history, how things have changed and what the vision is going forward. And just these relational approaches, like we're doing a little bit of work on the movement of nitrogen from scotch broom plants into the uh, adjacent forest, right? And it was like an elder that was like, well, why is the broom along there? Doesn't it make nitrogen? Maybe they're giving something to, because our new forests, they're nitrogen deficient because of the decline in, in fish stocks. So, you know, like there's so much value in opening up and just being alongside communities and letting communities lead that can inform our research. And the research I think is so much more exciting and richer as a result of that. That sounds like an awesome place to stop. There's so many more questions. So if you get a chance, answer that in the Q&A box. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gunz, for your time today and for starting out this meeting in such an inspirational way.
We look forward to following your work in the future. Um, great. So, and then as we transition here, I'm just going to hand over um, to my colleague here to introduce our plenary speaker. Thanks so much, Tony. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for joining us for the inaugural ISC. My name is Elliot Parsons, and I'm a specialist with the Pacific Regional Invasive Species and Climate Change Management Network. And I am one of the ISC conference organizers. I have the pleasure of introducing our plenary speaker today, Dr. Jessica Hellman. Dr. Jessica Hellman is director and Ecolab chair at the Institute on the Environment and Distinguished McKnight University Professor of Ecology at the University of Minnesota. She studies the impacts of climate change on natural systems and methods for adapting to climate change. She leads the Midwest Climate Adaptation Science Center for the U.S. Geological Survey. And in 2018, she co-founded Geofinancial Analytics, a private venture that benchmarks methane emissions in the oil and gas sector. She served several nonprofits as a board member, including the Science Museum of Minnesota, COMPASS, an NGO advancing societal engagement of scientists, and the National Audubon Society. The title of Dr. Hellman's plenary is Climate Change Adaptation Meets the Notion of Native and Invasive Species. Let's please give a warm welcome to Dr. Hellman and please take it away whenever you're ready. I would like to start, of course, by thanking you and all the other ISC organizers for the opportunity um, to be here, for inviting me to share some thoughts. It's really um, a pleasure to be in virtual community. Um, I love that Tori Lynn said we're all sitting in a room by ourselves, but we're really not by ourselves. We're with a bunch of colleagues, and uh, I feel that way, and I'm really aiming to share some thoughts with all of you that are relevant to the intersection of climate change adaptation as a pursuit and a set of new ideas and invasion and biology and invasive species management. I may raise more questions than I answer, and I hope that some of the thoughts um, that I have built into these slides are things that you all can carry forward into various sessions and discussions that you're all going to have at this extraordinary virtual conference. So, I'm leaning into this idea that maybe I'm helping to set the table for a lot of future conversations and grateful for the opportunity to do that. Okay, I'd like to start perhaps in a little bit of an unconventional way. I would like to open with some institutional context. As Elliot uh, suggested, I'm coming to you from a place called the Institute on the Environment at the University of Minnesota, where I serve as the executive director and at this institute, we believe in a few things. We have some empirical evidence um, to back our strategy, but we use that evidence to set our path forward. And I think it's relevant here. Specifically, we believe that a sustainable future is in fact possible and that to achieve it, higher education has a critical role to play. I come from higher education. And specifically, we need to be doing, and the Institute is advancing, this notion of building leaders, future leaders, telling compelling stories at scale, and producing what we call novel insights. And so critical for our purposes today, I'd like to sort of think about these new insights. What is a new insight? What is new knowledge? What does it mean to produce new knowledge? And how can we use new knowledge to shine the light on our path to a sustainable future? Sometimes when we're doing that, that new knowledge comes in the form of entirely new paradigms or new challenges that didn't exist before and that now have to be addressed. I want to talk about some new paradigms that have emerged in conservation biology, largely because of climate change and the notion of adapting to climate change. One more institutional context, I need to acknowledge um, a bunch of colleagues uh, because I also represent the Midwest Climate Adaptation Science Center as its consortium director. So I'm the PI responsible for eight collaborating institutions plus the USGS, and together we are pursuing science in climate change adaptation. And the Midwest is one of nine such centers uh, nationally within the United States, all working to deliver science to help fish, wildlife, water, land, and people adapt to a changing climate. Uh, and it's this notion of adaptation is what I want to talk about today. 
And uh, it's important that I acknowledge all these colleagues who are uh, coming along on this journey uh, with me. So what the heck, what is climate change adaptation? Many of us may have a, an intuition, but I'd like to, uh, or experience with this notion, but let's build some common frameworks or common understanding. Climate change adaptation refers to the actions, the doing that people, or sometimes managers, individuals who act on behalf of others, that people take to reduce the harms of climate change, and sometimes maybe also to take advantage of new opportunities when those opportunities arise. Adaptation applies in all sectors of our economy. It is always an interdisciplinary pursuit because it involves engineering or in economics and science and law and politics. In the Climate Adaptation Science Center and for all of us here today, adaptation, my conversation of them, is going to focus on the natural resources, which is sort of shorthand for species and ecosystems and the people that depend upon them. Because of course, nature is critical to human endeavors. And so we'll be talking about nature for people as well, whether that nature be in the city or on the farm or along the shoreline, all of those contexts are going to need adaptation. So if that's what adaptation is, let's take a moment and talk about what it's not. It is not mitigation. It is not international commitments to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. It is not the technology transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy. Those things are very important, but it's different than that. Instead, climate change adaptation is about living with the consequences of a changing climate. Whether that change is relatively smaller, like we might uh, achieve under the two degree C target of the Paris Agreement, that's the lower emission shown on this slide, or whether if that change is larger with warming upwards of six degrees Celsius or even more by the end of the century, as shown uh, for the high emission scenario on the right-hand side of this slide. Of course, adaptation is critical today. It's not just for the end of the century because climate change is not only a future challenge, it's here already. Around the world, average temperature has increased more than one degree C. And as shown in red on this graph, global temperature has become consistently warmer than average with a market shift occurring at about 1980. And months after months and years after years are now hotter than the ones that came before. This is the world we live in. In thinking about adaptation, we must remember, of course, that climate change is not just a change in mean temperature, it's also a change in the extremes. And frankly, often the extremes matter more than the mean. So when we're adapting to a changing climate, we must account for those extreme events. We're already experiencing extreme heat, flooding, hurricanes, wildfire seasons. Extremes matter a lot to infrastructure, to public health, but they also matter to species and ecosystems. And whichever climate we end up with, a relatively modestly warm one or an extremely warm one, we're gonna to have to adjust to it and tolerate those extremes. And of course, the relationship between stopping climate change and adjusting to climate change are interwoven. Now, there's a lot of public emphasis on the notion of mitigation, stopping climate change. And we hear a lot about the challenges associated with that. You open the paper any one day, you'll hear about cost. You'll hear about technology that's not yet invented or implemented, about shortages of materials for the renewable energy transition, about lack of incentives or necessary policies that we don't yet have, and even more. Plenty of issues and problems to work our way through. But there are a lot of significant challenges in adaptation too. And I'm going to take up our focus on natural resources and, and list some challenges in that context. First, for the most part, and though we have made considerable progress, we do still lack knowledge about the vulnerability of many species and ecosystems to climate change. We are still estimating how species respond to climate change and how consequential those changes are. 
We also largely lack information about the efficacy of possible adaptation interventions. All those actions that we're going to take in response to climate change to try to make things better, many of them we don't really know how effective they will be or how best or when to pursue them. The tools that are available to us, the possible actions, are also relatively sparse. Our adaptation toolbox is not very big or particularly built out. This lack of available adaptation tools, in fact, was the focus of a recent working group report that was just released a couple of weeks ago. That report is shown here and the URL for it down in the corner. This report talks about a number of things. It makes the point that most adaptation efforts are still the ones that we are using in the natural resource space are still largely based on conventional approaches and they're designed to achieve relatively incremental change. We have fewer tools that are transformational and fewer tools that are not something that we've already been doing before. This report also explores ways to increase adaptation innovation, the very process by which we would come up with new approaches and how we would do that specifically in the conservation and natural resource management fields. I'd love it if uh, folks would be willing to go check out that report. I think it has some interesting things to say. But any new tool that we develop, say, thanks to some innovative processes that facilitate a new tool development, any tool that we develop, just like all the tools that we have now, they always will have side effects and unintended consequences. So I show a picture of some medication here. We're accustomed to the idea that you take medication for a reason, but it will have some unintended side effects. The existence of side effects is a dominant feature of climate change adaptation. Of course, there are some other challenges. Here are a few more. An important one is that climate change removes historical analogs as a guide for conservation. We simply cannot return ecosystems to historic conditions now that the climate is different. Furthermore, some of our terms and concepts do not work well under climate change. I'll have more to say about that in a moment. An important challenge is that adaptation tends to look to experts for answers, for strategies and implementation. Yet the implications for adaptation, even in the natural resource sector, are as much social as they are ecological. And our last presentation had many interesting things to say about um, the cultural and human dimensions of invasion biology and invasive species management. That's true here too. So I'd like to dig into some of these challenges. I'm especially going to touch on the ones that are marked here in red. And to do that, I want to take us into a deep dive of one example adaptation strategy. And that strategy um, we call managed relocation. Managed relocation is the intentional movement of species or sometimes traits or genes uh, within a species from areas where that species or those traits historically occurred to new areas where they haven't occurred previously. You may have heard of this also as assisted migration. That term works for me, but I do have some reasons for not preferring that term, which we could discuss in the Q&A perhaps later. So I'm going to use this word, managed relocation. Managed relocation is on the table as an adaptation strategy because climate change shifts where a species can live. And promoting geographic range change, which is what is depicted in this Boston Globe cartoon, promoting geographic range change is one way that humans could positively intervene to facilitate population or species persistence. But like every other form of climate change adaptation, any action we take in response to a changing climate for species and ecosystems, it has its ups and its upsides and its downsides or its pros and its cons. So for managed relocation, the pros, the reasons why you would consider it in the first place are listed here on the left-hand side of this slide. You primarily would do managed relocation either for conservation purposes, be it at the species level or at the genetic level. Think endangered species, for example, or you do it for ecosystem function, ecosystem service, or some notion of overall ecosystem health. Maybe think about a foundational forest species or a commercial timber species, for example. 
The cons are potential negative side effects. Here are a few. It will take time and money, and that money could be spent on something else, which we could think of as an opportunity cost. Maybe that's something else that we could spend our money on that would be more effective. Introduced populations, of course, could become too abundant and make a new pest. The introduced species could have negative effects on non-target species in the introduced habitat. Sourcing individuals for introduction could diminish native populations, so we might be making conservation in the native range worse. And importantly, managed relocation might not be good enough. It may not be up to the task if our task is not just species by species, but some notion of biodiversity conservation and ecosystem services in the context of climate change. So it might not be enough, this one tactic applied many count times to address the biodiversity and climate change challenge writ large. So when we decide on managed relocation, which for the most part has not yet happened, it's not going to be any different than any other adaptation decision. We're going to weigh the relative pros and the cons. And to do that, we're going to need information about each of the things listed on this slide. Now, one of the biggest cons on this slide, and one particularly pertinent to this audience, is the risk of creating a new pest species. I want to talk about that for a moment. So actually, many years ago now, uh, a student and I were the first to look into this risk and to see if we could attempt to quantify the risk of creating invasive under a managed relocation type of scenario. And so what we did is we used invasive species in North America as an analog for the concept of managed relocation. We did that by comparing invasives that come from outside of the continent, what we call intercontinental invasives, to those that come from within North America or intracontinental invasives, within North America being analogous to managed relocation. That's what you'd be doing, shifting ranges, not moving things from faraway continents. And we found that the vast majority of invasive species or species that were designated as invasive in North America do come from other parts of the world. And that's the gray part of the bars in this graph. And by analogy, this would suggest that the risk of moving species within the continent is pretty low. Actually, in fact, about 14% of invasive species in our uh, database uh, had an intracontinental origin. But I just pulled up a new graph on the right-hand side of this slide, and that breaks the data on the left-hand side down by taxonomic group. And here you can get a much more nuanced picture. And in this picture, in this graph, you can see that upwards of half of invasive species have an intracontinental origin in some groups like fish. And that suggests that not all cases of managed relocation are the same. In some of these groups, the risk, the, the fraction of invasive species that come from within the continent is quite low in some groups and kind of alarmingly high in other groups. Taken together, we think that the risk of creating a pest, something we might have called an invasive, is most certainly there in our database. It's not necessarily given that an intercontinental invasion or introduction would result in what would be considered invasive. The likelihood is, or the percentage is relatively low in some cases and quite high in certain situations and groups. So that's a very abstract notion. That's actually looking over hundreds and hundreds of species using our designation of what a non-native is. Let's put this whole idea in a much more concrete context and let's talk about a real creature. Let's think about managed relocation, its potential application in a conservation setting using an example. And so I'd like to introduce this creature. This is the Carner blue butterfly. This is a federally listed endangered species. I've had the privilege with some colleagues of studying the species with models, with warming experiments, and some field observations. I want to show you some modeling results to thinking about managed relocation for this butterfly. These black dots show you where the Carner blue lives, or at least where it lived in the recent past. And what some colleagues and I did is we used a 
statistical niche model that maps the occupancy, these black dots under climate conditions, and then predicts the future occupancy of the Kerner blue when the climate changes under future climate conditions. So here we go. This green shading shows the predicted future occupancy by the next decade, so by in the 2030s. And what you'll see is that the conditions suitable for the Kerner blue begin to move northward. We're here in the Northern hemisphere. This is in a highly mountainous range. And so northward movement is what you might expect. A few decades later, those conditions have moved even further to the north. And this is a, a relatively modest or sort of intermediate warming scenario I'm showing to you. And by the end of the century, the green areas, which are future predicted occupancy, and the black dots, historic occupancy, they're about 500 kilometers apart in the closest spot. And that is a very long way for a little, fairly sedentary butterfly to fly. These results suggest no overlap between the current range and the future range of the Kerner blue, at least considering climate without any additional interventions, and they suggest that future range is too far away and it moves too quickly for a little butterfly to keep up. So should we move the Carner blue to some of those green areas? To answer that question is actually the culmination of a bunch of other finer questions, some of which are listed on this slide. It's perhaps not exhaustive, but if we did this, would it actually save the species from extinction? Where would we put it? Would our efforts work if we tried to introduce it? Would, be, would be, be successful? What is our definition of success? What are the benefits and the risks? And this is a question that came up in the Q&A. Who's going to make that call? Who gets to decide about the relative benefits and risks? And who will cover the expense of time and effort to get this done? So I want to first think uh, about where we might put the Carner Blue and the efficacy of movement. And some more sophisticated modeling can give us some insights into this where question. So our model of suitable climate actually suggests that the Carner Blue occupies two different climate spaces. You can almost think of it like two different species living in diff slightly different conditions. And I'm not showing you the analysis behind this, but basically if you take a principal components analysis, you'll see that the populations marked Western and Eastern occupy distinct climatic niches. So what we did is we went back to our model and we treated these two climatic regions separately and built new niche models and new future range predictions. These are those modeling results. The left-hand side of this slide, I've already shown you, those are those green blobs. The right-hand side is what happens when you model the Eastern and Western forms separately. And when you do that, model as a whole versus model these different climatic niches separately, you get some different answers about where, about occupancy. Let me point out a few. Specifically by mid-century, the whole species model, green, predicts that the butterfly could live in Northern Ontario. But if there are different forms of a single species, neither the Western nor the Eastern form would be predicted to occur in that region. And later in the century, the models with the population differences suggest that Appalachia could be suitable, the Appalachian mountains could be suitable for Eastern form populations, but the whole species model doesn't highlight that region at all. So if we ponder where conservation of this Carner Blue is even possible in the future, this functional ecology of the species and the presence or absence of functional differences within a species may really matter when we go thinking about where we would actually do this conservation and where an introduction might take place. So let's next ask if there are some possible side effects or things to worry about if we were to introduce the Carner Blue into new areas. This table I'm showing on this slide comes from a study of managed relocation that we did for the National Park Service. And we used the Carner Blue and several other species as case studies. So this is the case study for the Carner Blue. 
I don't need you to see individual details in this table. So don't squint and lean into the screen. I want you to look at the colors. Um, what this table does is it looks at a number of different dimensions or risk criteria, if you will, dimensions of managed relocation, and then scores those different features of the risk by color. So green is like, oh, that's not such a big risk. Uh, orange and red are, wow, these are larger risks. So we can begin to pinpoint certain ecological features with in different managed relocation cases. In the corner blue, I'm gonna circle it here, draw your attention to this orange area. The higher risk that we identified making our way through this case study has to do with the nitrogen fixing quality of the Kerner Blues host plant. It feeds on lupin. Um, and that lupin, because it's nitrogen fixing, it alters the local soil and the plant environment. And that could be the case where it's planted or even where it's just cultivated or encouraged for the Kerner Blue. So the effects of the actions we would take to promote the Karner might be some of the higher risk uh, um, dimensions for this case. These other risks, yellow or green, we found them to be relative, either more modest or that they, those risks could potentially be managed or mitigated. So in this example, we think that it could be the other species necessary for the Karner blue that could be the greatest risk variable. And of course, of adding other species or thinking about other species adds a whole nother level of complexity to the notion of species introduction. All right, let's think about this extended example creature here for a moment. We're going to need information about the vulnerability of this species to climate change. We're going to need to evaluate the pros and cons of possible actions. We're gonna to need to look at the tactical implementation of those actions in order to make any decision about managed relocation for the Kerner Blue. But for this species or any other, technical information is really just not enough. We also have to confront what we think about and how we feel about and how we classify and how we talk about those actions and the outcomes of those actions. And one thing I think in the case of managed relocation is we're gonna to need to think about whether or not we embrace this introduction or the notion of managed relocation in our conservation or how we embrace it in our conservation lexicon. If we introduce the Karner in new locations where the climate becomes suitable for them, should we think of them as native in that location? Are they non-native, but they're still valuable? Could a non-native species be a conservation priority? This might be you know, outside of a commercial context. Furthermore, what does a successful introduction look like? Surely a successful introduction is a population that really takes, it's even flourishing or vigorous. Uh, don't we want our introductions to result in vigorous populations? But if we're too successful with our introduction, the species might become too abundant and in that abundance become a pest or the things that we might need to foster for the introduced species like the lupin could be pest-like having negative impacts on other species. So if an introduced species is non-native and it's too successful, even if we introduce it on purpose, should we consider it invasive? Uh, under what conditions should we think about an introduction gone awry for climate adaptation? Should we put them in the invasive category? And then we start controlling that population or even trying to reverse the introduction. I'll put these as questions because I don't know the answers. I have some opinions, but my point is that it conflicts a little bit with the notions that we previously have about where species are supposed to be or how we will manage them as a consequence of where they live. I think instead of focusing on native or invasive, what we must do is define our conservation objectives. We have to define what does success look like? We have to decide what negative side effects we are most concerned about and so that we can weigh those negative side effects against the positive reasons that we took adaptation action in the first place. And to help us decide what to do in the face of those pros and cons and our objectives and our um, expression of those objectives, we're gonna need, and to think about trade-offs, we're gonna need some decision support tools. Those tools, they're gonna help us visualize what, what actions we might take 
And ideally, we'll have tools that enable us to consider different points of view or different stakeholders who might have different opinions or values or objectives. So way back in 2009, there was a paper written by a managed relocation working group that presented one such tool. Specifically, it offered a framework composed of four different dimensions for decision making. There are four different axes. I'll walk through them quickly. The first axis is the top one. That's the impact of climate change on a species of concern. And I'm showing you here an example worked up, a hypothetical thought exercise for another endangered butterfly is what we had in mind when we developed this particular one. We did it for a few other species as well. This is the bay checker spot butterfly, another federally listed species. So the focal impact is how consequential is climate change for the conservation of this species? You give it a high score if it's going to be highly impacted by climate change. The second axis, the one on the bottom, is orthogonal to in the opposite direction of focal impact. And that's what we call collateral damage. We actually call it one minus collateral damage. So a high score is it wouldn't have a lot of collateral damage. Collateral damage is the negative consequences in the area where it's introduced for other species. The third is off to the left. That's what we call social acceptability. Do people want this action or will they tolerate it? And off to the right is feasibility of managed relocation. That might be technical feasibility or legal feasibility or economic feasibility. So on the left is a case of support for managed relocation. Imagine like butterfly enthusiasts. There is significant evidence they would say that the species is threatened by climate change, so they give it a high focal impact score. It's a specialized butterfly with no history of outbreaks, so one minus its collateral effect is also high. It's feasible to capture these guys, to grow them in the lab and introduce them, so their feasibility score is high. And in the case of these enthusiasts, they, they really would accept this conservation action, perhaps in the form of managed relocation. The different colors are intended to express some variation in opinion. On the right is a stakeholder who sees the situation very differently. This stakeholder happens to agree that moving the butterfly might be feasible, but places a lower value on the conservation risk of the species from climate change, a higher risk on unintended effects of introduction, and a, a, has a pretty low interest or demand for the introduction overall in form of acceptability. So on the left, the area field is quite large, and on the right, it's much smaller. And what we can see by comparing these is specifically which aspects of managed relocation cause disagreement between the stakeholder groups. And our thought was that this kind of graphing exercise or being explicit about the dimensions of decision-making could lead to a dialogue about the need for action or what actions are appropriate. And so my question for all of you is what kinds of tools should we or could we be using like this one to stimulate conversation about adaptation and species management? Maybe some of you have tools to offer in that conversation. So my time is winding down here. I'd like to leave you with three parting thoughts. First, in the light of climate change adaptation, a specific example of managed relocation and also a creature that gave us some insights. I think that what I've shared with you for me draw three conclusions that I'd like you to carry forward. One is just how important it is to define our management objectives and what success looks like. Previously, conservation biology looked to historic analogs. Where does the Kerner blue supposed to live? To guide restoration and species management, but climate change has taken that off the table. Before climate change, we also created definitional categories like native, non-native, invasive, but those don't necessarily work well under climate change, and they certainly don't work when we're introducing species into new locations for conservation purposes. Second, though a lot of the discussion about climate change and climate change adaptation is taking place among technical experts like us, the implications of adaptation actions are broad and different stakeholders will have different values and objectives for adaptation. And that means that the public must be part of the dialogue about climate change adaptation. My dream is that you will open the newspaper and you will see stories about adapting to climate change that are as rich and alive as stopping climate change. And third, 
I invite you to think about how climate change adaptation might influence your own thinking or the way that you do your work in species management and invasion biology. Again, I've talked a lot about managed relocation as an extended example, but adaptation is always an intervention and therefore any adaptation action I think shares some core features with my example of managed relocation. Before I go, I got a plug I wanna share with all of you. That is an advertisement for a postdoctoral fellowship that we have at my institute that's open right now. If you know uh, um, a recent grad or soon to be PhD grad who's interested in a really rich interdisciplinary, very translation oriented scholarly community, we are the place and we have a cohort based competitive interdisciplinary postdoctoral program that is currently open. And I invite you to uh, visit our website at z.umn.edu. You can also navigate that from the Institute on the Environment webpage applications due in March. Please help me spread the word. Uh, it's a really great program. So thank you everybody for your attention. Importantly, thank you for your work to understand nature and how best we can conserve and steward it. I know you are all doing um, vital work addressing some really important challenges and um, together we will make progress in addressing and uh, figuring out how to um, have positive progress uh, against the climate impacts that we collectively confront. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Hellman, for a very wonderful and thought-provoking presentation. And we have a lot of questions in the Q&A. Uh, I have some as well, but I'm going to go for all the others before uh, I ask. Them. We had 770 people online just a few minutes ago, so maybe there's the perfect postdoc out there. So please, please forward that and apply as well. So the first question has to do with what you talked about, your preferred term being managed relocation. And, and yep. someone asked why you didn't like assisted migration or another one I thought of is conservation introductions. Conservation introductions, I would like better. Assisted migration, I think, can be a very useful sort of colloquial term. But at least in our working group, we are not enamored with the word assisted and we're not enamored with the word migration. Assisted is normative. Why wouldn't anyone want to assist? Uh, yes, we are doing it, again, because the benefits outweigh the costs, presumably. Um, but managed, alternatively, tells us something about what we are actually doing rather than what our preferences are. In the attempt, scientists, science and scientists are never truly objective. We are all people participating in this endeavor. But our language can try, strive to be a little bit more where, where we can to try to distract our values. And then migration is, we are trying to assist in the migration. We're trying to promote geographic range change, but there are actually a whole set of tools that you might do from introduction. Once a species is introduced, presumably we have an obligation to continue monitoring and managing. So it's not just assisted migration, but a whole suite of responsibilities that would be associated with that relocation, we felt. So it's less of a cute term. Assisted migration does a really nice job of conveying the notion, but it also made people think about um, those little ultralights flying with geese. Uh, so that was another reason to come up with a new term. Great, thank you so much. There's another question here, and this goes back to the, I think it was the 2009 study you showed us between the intra and yep. intercontinental origins. So somebody asked why uh, are there no amphibians in the intercontinental origin group? Yeah, so ooh, you're asking me a question that would cause me to go back and look at that at the methods. So we built that database looking over a variety of state invasive species lists and making sure that we compiled across a wide number of taxonomic groups. Um my guess is, but I'd have to confirm, and if this question ans um, asker would like a real answer, I would love um, an email from them and we'll toss my email address in the uh, oh, chat. Uh, I'm gonna guess that our sample size wasn't large enough to statistically pull out just amphibians, but I have to double check that, I'm not certain. Uh, and, and I'm going to slip in a, qu a quick question. I know we've got a, a talk that's going to touch on this coming up, but should we be 
thinking about coming up with new terms to replace native invasive? Should we be trying to standardize terminology? Do, do you have any thoughts on how we move forward? <laughs> yes. So I just argued with respect to managed relocation and assisted migration that terminology does matter, right? So I have to say, yes, we should be very specific in our terminology. However, I actually think new words don't get us exactly what we need when we're thinking about adaptation. I think more importantly is that we have to define what we're striving to accomplish. So we can have the terminology to go alongside, but it's not a substitute. What I think is provocative about the notion of invasive and native is it does also suggest how we would respond to those species, what our conservation objectives would be. I don't think even when we come up with new terms of not native, but we put it there and we want to treat it like it's native, maybe there's a word for that, but that won't be a substitute for what adaptation actions we should take or how aggressive we should be or how much money we should spend or who gets to decide. So I think there's two things. One is the right words. And two is we're going to be confronted with kind of a decoupling about conservation objectives that we're accustomed to in, you know, invasion and biology. Invasives are things that we're trying to control. Friendly non-natives, I like that. But Thank friendly, so that's normative. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. There's a question about the Carner Blue and actually two questions. One, do the host plants now live in the area that's predicted for the movement? And then, the, yes. the, yeah, go ahead. Yes and no. The host plant distribution is larger than the Carner Blue distribution. So you could do managed relocation to places where the lupin already lives, but some of those green blobs that I showed don't have lupin. So in some locations, you might need to introduce it or even where it occurs, Again, you have to come back to defining what success looks like. Even if lupin is present, you might end up finding yourself managing for or trying to encourage um, lupin. It turns out for the Carner Blue that oftentimes, especially in the Great Lakes region, it's occupying sandy soil, sometimes in dune habitats. That's particularly where you might think about, and there are a whole suite of dune plants that are of conservation concern, that if you were both promoting, enabling, or introducing lupins, that could change the soil chemistry that would be particularly prominent in a dune type of habitat. Great, thank you. Next Carner Blue question, uh, I'm going to rephrase it a little bit, but I think in essence is, in a sense, maybe one of the takeaways from your case study is that you need to really think carefully about the species, learn a ton about it. That maybe what you end up doing is very context dependent. So are there any landscape scale approaches or do we have to take everything, you know, one piece at a time? So I'm gonna start to answer this, Elliot, and I'm gonna answer a slightly different question because I wanna swing at this softball or this ball that I think has been tossed up there for me. I've worked and talked and thought a lot about managed relocation specifically for a long time. A lot of the papers I referenced are getting dated in my presentation. And I'm always asked if I'm a proponent of managed relocation. And I say, no, I'm not a proponent of it, but I'm also less scared of it than I think a lot of people are, one. And two, I am scared about climate change impacts on biodiversity. My biggest critique of managed relocation is its inadequacies, which I suggested on my cons slide. If I'm looking at global biodiversity and the scale of the challenge that climate change presents for global biodiversity, I'm going to be skeptical of a tactic that goes along species by species by species by species, because we do not have enough time or attention to do every Carner Blue along the way. That's not to say that it couldn't be very meaningful for the Carner Blue. And then coming back to your this specific question, I do think that there's a lot of ecological context and species specificity in a managed relocation context. Does that extend to all adaptation actions that they would always be highly context specific or species specific? Could there be a larger landscape perspective for some other adaptation actions like burning fire frequency? Maybe, probably. 
I have a harder time thinking about what that would be beyond general principles for managed relocation. Oh, great. Thank you so much. This is related to that question. And somebody pointed out that, that there could be a focus on charismatic species that we you know look at for managed relocation. And so is there a way to also maybe think about those that are ecosystem engineers or strong interactors or foundation right. species? Yeah. So I think managed relocation, in fact, when you see, if you look at the degree to which it's been talked about in the popular press, there was an article about it in the New York Times Magazine just a couple of months ago, and that was about redwoods, right? Here I'm talking about endangered butterflies. I do, in my sort of lived experience of discussing this issue, it comes up for commercial species, for federally listed species, maybe that have a, a regulatory or a legal obligation or charismatic species. And you could also imagine that because any adaptation action will incur costs or effort, there will need to be some sort of constituency or advocacy group for a particular species. And that's more likely, I think, for a charismatic or an economically important species. As an insect person, I do think about all the creepy crawlies that make the world go round, some of which we don't even know where they live or how they are affected by climate change. So I worry that's back to sort of my biodiversity worry problem. The level of risk aversion that we have is important. I mean, there's nothing that would necessarily prevent us from taking entire suites of species and haphazardly introducing them in new areas and saying, you know, hey, let nature sort it out. And that could presumably be pursued on a much larger scale. I guess my own intuition is that we would do it in a more evaluative case-by-case -case scenario, but maybe if we're confronting particularly large amounts of climate change, that'll get set aside. I, I'm so glad you brought that up because one of the questions did ask about the idea of ecosystem relocation as opposed to, to species relocation. I don't know if, uh, if, has anyone tried moving more than one species that you know of to a new place? Well, we're still not in an era of implementation of managed relocation, or frankly, we're not really in an era of large-scale climate change adaptation either. I mean, maybe we're beginning to see some changes in seed zoning, seed sourcing, or burning frequency, or maybe some changes in harvest frequency or something like that, but certainly not on the scale that we're going to imagine it being... I'm not aware of cases of multiple species being moved, but I'm not aware of many cases of managed relocation in general. We're still kind of in the talking about it phase, though there are individual cases, especially of motivated individuals on private land doing some things. There's another butterfly that I study. I like to think about multi-species introductions. You can start, if you start with something that's a little bit of a higher consumer, like an herbivore, you can imagine how you'll end up with multiple species, whether you want to or not. Like we were talking about lupin, I have this other butterfly I used to study that feeds on oak trees. And it does have a range boundary with the oak. So if you wanted to move the species further, the butterfly further to the north, you would have to move the oak to the north. And that oak, there's some other evidence suggests flourishes and does well, especially seedling survival when it's inoculated in a soil that has mycorrhizae. So now we're talking about mycorrhizae for the purposes of butterfly conservation. And my guess is that many, 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 even species specific cases will get us into these kinds of multi-species assemblages, whether we want to or not. Uh, thank you. I, I have a question that um, I know we posted a link in a chat to a, a new framework from the Fish and Wildlife Service that came out recently on managed relocation. Um, so there is that, but are there any other dis decision support tools that you know about and would recommend? Yeah, also the Park Service has the new RAD framework, which helps us think back to that conservation objective. What is it that we're trying to do? RAD asks us that, are we trying to keep things the way they were? Are we trying to enable sort of natural change or are we striving toward tra um, system transformation? I think from my sort of continually arguing that we have to talk about what we're trying to achieve and not kind of bury that implied as it has been in many of our conservation objectives before, 
it's not directly a decision support tool, but I often talk, I think that's a really important um, sort of mainstreaming way of conceiving of adaptation and wrapping our head around it. Um, great, thanks for that. Maybe one of my colleagues can put a, a link uh, uh, about the RAD framework into the chat. And I know there are also some Northeast uh, risk management challenges that could be helpful as well. Um, I'm sure people may know their own tools and if they're willing to share, I think um, we don't wanna rebuild these decision support tools. So if someone's got a good one, we need to spread them around. Sorry, I, you know, to, yeah, no, thank, thanks so much. To, to, to follow up to one of your last slides, you had mentioned really wanting to elevate the dialogue about climate change adaptation and the risk is one way to do that. Are there other uh, ways to engage in that conversation for the folks online? Well, I don't like to speak of it out loud because I might be undermining my own uh, self, but I'm working on a book. My, I'm three quarters of a way through a book. So that's my answer. I'm writing it for a popular audience where I'm basically making this argument that says, I'm imagining my reader is like a master gardener, somebody who's concerned about climate change and cares a lot about nature. And maybe even a person who's very engaged in um, the mitigation side. Oh, I've got solar on my roof. I want an electric vehicle. And my argument is take that same level of engagement, social engagement you have around greenhouse gas mitigation, and we need you over in the adaptation side of things too. So I think um, to the degree to which we can all be talking with our neighbors, talking to our elected officials, not necessarily just telling them what adaptation actions to do, but to invite this broader public discourse, I think is really important. Thank you. Uh, and definitely please let us know when your book comes out. We're getting close to the top of the hour. I've got a couple more questions for, for you, uh, Dr. Helm, if that's all right. And then we're going to put up a quick slide. So I'll show our uh, quick results from the map of where folks are from, and then we'll go on a uh, short break. Th this one I, I thought was really interesting. There's been a lot of development in the last couple of decades on urban ecology. And, and so the question is really what role uh, managed relocation might play in, in urban areas? I think that's a fascinating question. And when we think about these different kinds of adaptation tools, I talked about where might we do this, where I made this map of where the corner could live. And I'm imagining managers like picking pixels and saying, where could we do an activity? But there's an entirely different where question about the nature of the landscape. And I do think that the urban environment, to the degree that it's already highly manipulated, it's got a lot of non-native species in it already, and that attentiveness to nature providing services for people in the urban environment, I think it does present a sort of natural laboratory that we might think of for managed relocation or other adaptation actions where we're nervous about them in a more uh, wilderness kind of context, or maybe where we're anxious that there would be more opportunity for spread and in the urban environments a little more isolated or contained. I did a little bit of research several years ago on green roofs in the city of Chicago. I have this little fantasy that we could have green roofs everywhere around Chicago, and then we could have little Carner blue populations on top of them. <laughs> but uh, I don't know if that's feasible. That's a whole nother study. No, that would be really, that would be really neat. I want to end on a, on a fun question because, you know, maybe this is an idea to include along with your book when it comes out. Has anyone made a game for invasive species management similar to the watershed game uh, made by Maggie and John at Minnesota Sea Grant? If so, what's the objective? Who's the audience? How did it go? Oh, I don't know. We need to, off the top of my head, I don't, but I bet there are some and it would be, a, I mean, all of adaptation would make for a great strategic game. And also, I think I have this other study that I want to do, which is really hard. But in the mitigation world, we have these concept of wedges of mitigation, right? We need a certain amount of solar and we're going to need a little bit of wind. And then we argue about how big the wedge should be about nuclear. But that's really advanced the conversation that we need a portfolio of solutions the same thing has got to be the case in adaptation. We're going to need multiple tactics. And I think that strategy of putting a certain amount of this tactic plus a certain amount of that tactic, how much do you need? This question of sort of sufficiency, I think it would be neat if we could do some kind of wedges analysis of how much of each kind of tool we need to deploy on a landscape in order to achieve, say, conservation of all endangered species in a continent, for example. I think that would be a neat study. 
and it would make a great game. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Hellman. Really appreciate it. Such a great presentation and list of questions and also helping us engage this conversation with everybody. We really appreciate it. So thank you again. Okay, well, we are going to move into uh, a break in a second. Uh, I do have a, a quick slide to show you. This is from the Menti poll. I'm just going to share my screen really quick. Hopefully everybody can see that. So this is where you are from. This is the first question for our Menti poll. Thanks so much for everyone who filled this out. Uh, we've got quite a few responses. And there is a QR code right there that you can use your phone or, or pad or device to access that and fill out the Menti poll if you haven't done that yet. But it looks like there are folks from all over, including North America, South America, Africa, Europe, uh, New Zealand, and even Antarctica. So thank you so much for everyone for joining us for that. And with that, we are going to just go uh, to a short break. This will be for about nine minutes now. Uh, and I also just want to send a, a quick thank you again to our partners on this, the Canadian Council on Invasive Species, Island Conservation, uh, NISMA, of course, a huge uh, co- partner in this endeavor and wouldn't happen uh, without them. Northwest Climate Adaptation Science Center, Florida Climate Institute, North Central Climate Adaptation Science Center, Pacific Islands Climate Adaptation Science Center, Invasive Species Center, the Northeast Climate Adaptation Science Center, and the Southeast Climate Adaptation Science Center, and Island Conservation as well. So thank you so much to our partners for helping us pull this off and broadcast this out to the network, and we'll see you back in just a few minutes. So welcome back to, after that short break to the next session of the ISC. I'm still working on my pronunciation. Um, my name is Bethany Bradley. I am a part of the Northeast Regional Invasive Species and Climate Change network uh, leadership team and I am just happy to uh, introduce this next session. I'll be moderating this next session called New Arrivals. So we're going to be hearing everything from uh, information about terminology to new introduction pathways to thinking about species that are already here but maybe um, moving around um, in space or changing their abundance. I think a lot of the times when we think about invasive species and climate change or when we're thinking about compounding effects of these different stressors on ecosystems, it's really sobering, right? It's a really big challenge to think about both of those two together. But I think also what you're going to see in this next session is that there's a lot of ways that we can shift that thinking to make it more proactive. So if we think about the invasion curve, right, where you start out low and you end up in this really highly invaded space, a lot of the species that we're managing are up at that high end. You know, the horse is already out of the barn. It's too late to stop those species from arriving or to eradicate species when they're newly arrived. And when we add climate change to, to invasive species management, it actually puts us back to the beginning of that invasion curve, to that space where we do have opportunities to think about stopping species before they arrive uh, or controlling them in the early areas, uh, early time periods of, of infestation. So I invite you to keep that in mind as we're going through these different talks this afternoon on new arrivals. So with that, I am going to invite our first speakers to go ahead and share screen. I will introduce uh, Dr. Emily Fusco, who is the Deputy University Director of the Northeast Climate Adaptation Science Center. Hi, everyone. I'm Emily Fusco, and I am the Deputy University Director at the Northeast Climate Adaptation Science Center. I worked on this project while I was a research scientist at the University of Washington Climate Impacts Group and coordinator of the Northwest Risk. And this project is really the result of a major collaborative effort from across the risk regions and associated institutions. Okay, so we're going to start with some familiar terms. And the definitions and even use of these terms have been debated in their own right. Uh, but we can hopefully agree that these are all terms that we've seen often used in invasion ecology. 
Uh, but with the changing climate, we have this new invasive species and climate change lexicon that's begun to emerge that describes how species ranges and impacts are changing. But there's a lot of ambiguity associated with these terms and that can result in confusion, especially when we need really precise language to apply policy or management options. So to address this issue, rather than push for a standardization of terms, uh, we're gonna offer a framework for organizing them. So we can start again with these familiar terms. So in an ecosystem, uh, we might call a species native, non-native, or invasive. It would have this kind of status. And then with climate change, the species might have two options. So it can either stay where it is, or it can shift to a new range. There's also kind of these two options for impacts. So either uh, a species is going to have no known negative impact or a known negative impact after climate change. So if you start off with a species that has native status in an ecosystem and in response to climate change, it stays where it is and continues not to have an impact, it would just keep its native status. Uh, the species could also shift its range to a new ecosystem. And even if it's still not having any impacts, people might start calling it maybe a climate tracker or a range shifter, for example. Uh, the species could also shift and start having a negative impact and people might start calling it something like a nuisance neonative or the species might also stay put but start having an impact. That's what we're seeing here in box A. And interestingly, we didn't really find any terms that folks are using to describe this specific situation. Uh, you can do the same thing with species that have this non-native or naturalized status in an ecosystem. So this is where you see that term sleeper species start to pop up. Um, and for species that start with an invasive status. So by putting things into this framework, what we've done is brought to light these scenarios that don't have terms yet, so in boxes A, B, C, and D, and we've also provided a way to accommodate this proliferation of new terms so that people can have a common understanding of the ecological context that's going on regardless of what term folks are using. So now we're going to look at four real-world examples and use them to demonstrate when and why getting to this common understanding and reducing this ambiguity in what we're talking about is most important. And so the examples all have varying amounts of ambiguity associated with climate change, and they also have varying levels of disagreement and an important management decision that needs to be made. And this disagreement is the consequence that we're focused on. So we can use levels of ambiguity and consequence to determine when it's worthwhile to address the ambiguity as a way to mitigate the consequence. So in our first example, the southern pine beetle moved north of its native range and into New York State as a result of climate change. In New York, the species' native status was highly ambiguous. And as a result, there was high disagreement in how to fund management because some of the funding required species to have a non-native status. So eventually what they did is determine that the species should be considered native and therefore specific pots of funding for non-native species shouldn't be used. And so in the case of the southern pine beetle, there was high ambiguity about the species' native status, and the consequence was high disagreement in which funding source to use for management. So here, addressing that ambiguity with an expert panel largely resolved the consequence. So another example here is the golden jackal. So this has expanded its range in Europe, uh, largely in response to climate change. The Bern Convention specifically stipulates that native species that are shifting their ranges in response to climate change cannot be considered non-native. So there's not really any ambiguity there, but there's a huge range in response for how to manage the species, both across and within countries. Uh, and the species can have anything from this status that ranges from protected to huntable, depending on where you are. Uh, so here there's low ambiguity in the species native status because it's defined by this convention, but there's still really high disagreement about species management. Uh, in our next example, uh, we have the Cabeus vine. Uh, and so the native status of this vine is debated across the, the Pacific Islands, but in Palau it is considered native. Uh, but the Cabeus has negative ecological impacts and it's shifting its range and it may also become even more problematic with climate change. So regardless of any ambiguity around the species native status or its causes for range shifts or changes to impacts, there's actually really low disagreement that the vine should be managed in Palau uh, because it has such a high negative ecological impact. So for the Cabeus vine, there's high ambiguity around the species' native status, but low disagreement that it should be managed. And finally, back in the U.S., we have this native white-tailed deer. 
Uh, so at high population levels, deer can have negative ecological impacts. And as winters become milder with climate change, their populations and impacts are expected to increase in some areas. Uh, but in these cases, there's really low disagreement about whether changing harvest limits could be used to reduce populations and mitigate negative impacts. So this lands deer in our lower left corner, down here in the lower left. And so using this method, what we can see is that it's really maybe most strategic to address these situations where there's high ambiguity for things that land in the top right corner, where addressing the ambiguity can resolve the consequence. So that was illustrated in the pine beetle example. All right, so we've seen that species range shifts and potential ecological impacts are changing in response to climate change, and that an invasive species and climate change lexicon has emerged to communicate these new ecological scenarios. Uh, but these terms are defined and applied inconsistently across institutions and jurisdictions. Uh, so what we've done is we've constructed this new framework that can accommodate a diversity of new terms, and that can help alleviate confusion among the folks that need to employ these terms. Um, and in some cases, there may be some really meaningful consequences to the ambiguity uh, behind these climate change related invasive species terms. And resolving this ambiguity is oftentimes going to require resources. So what we've also presented here is this uh, framework that can be used to strategically approach when it's worth uh, resolving the ambiguity here by looking at that relationship between ambiguity and consequence. Thanks so much, Emily, for taking us through a whirlwind of the uh, of various different terminologies and how we're thinking about things. Um, there are a couple of questions in the Q&A, so I, I'm going to read one of them to you. Um, asking a question about whether everybody's thinking in terms of the same geography, you know, so when we consider something to be native, non-native, you know, does it feel like it's consistent across agencies and across political or other borders as to how people are defining those in terms of geography? Yeah, that's a great question. So there are discrepancies with how people are defining nativeness in terms of geography, also in terms of temporal scale as well. So how long has something been there? Was it there before? And so even back to those really simple terms that we've been using for so long, there's a ton of, you know, debate about how to define those terms and how to reach some common understanding there. That said, I think that with the framework that we presented, what we're hoping that folks can do is kind of work within the definitions that they need to work within for their agency or institution, and then go from there with those original terms and then get to this next step of what's going on and how do we incorporate climate change into how we're defining things. Super, thanks. Got a follow-up question here too of uh, just a lot of issues around the terminology of invasive versus non-native. I know that was one of the questions in the mentee poll too of you know definitions for invasive species and just what you see as the current landscape on that. Yeah, so again, like a lot of debate with those terms and folks still haven't really reached a conclusion and we haven't really landed on a consensus there. Uh, but even though there's still debate on those terms, most of the times it seems like folks that are working within regulatory contexts are working with some kind of definition. Um, so they may not all agree with each other, but oftentimes within an institution, there is something that is defined. Really hoping to start working from not rehashing those older debates about the terminology that we're already been working with, uh, but finding ways to bring in what's going on with climate change and applying those new ideas within the context of how you and your institution are having to define those terms. Fabulous. So thanks so much, Emily. If anyone has more questions, and there are some more questions in the Q&A, please feel free to add your questions to the Q&A, and Emily, I think, can stick around for a little bit to answer those. Our next speaker in this session is uh, Tony Lynn Morelli, who you've seen before and you'll see again. So Tony Lynn is a research ecologist with the U.S. Geological Survey and the Northeast Climate Adaptation Science Center. And she is going to be talking today about climate-driven range shifts of invasive species and nuisance neonatives. Over to you, Tony Lynn. Thanks, Bethany, and great job to Emily. Thanks for the intro. I'm very happy to be back, and I'm glad that uh, I'm following the terminology discussion. So I work for the Northeast Climate Adaptation Science Center, and 
You're going to hear cask a lot today and tomorrow. So I'm just showing you a map of the casks and there's nine of them. So I'm at the Northeast cask, but there's a lot of folks like Dr. Hellman that are representing other casks here today. And so check that out. Maybe somebody can drop a link for the casks in the chat, but there's great work happening at the casks at climate adaptation and on invasive species. Also the risks. So hopefully now this is starting to sound familiar. We've got six risks, including the one in Canada. And I was with Bethany Bradley and Carrie Brown Lima, the founder of the Northeast risk, which was the first risk. So we started the whole network about 2016 and it's just been fantastic experience. And I'll brag a little bit about the work we've accomplished uh, a little bit more in this talk and you'll hear about it later on. Why? Why did we start the risks? Well, we saw that there was this need from um, partners, the practitioners and the managers, and many of you are here today. In fact, the majority of the 750 people here are managers or practitioners. One of the reasons that this topic was coming up over and over again is that climate change is really exacerbating the impacts of invasive species. So you can see that here. This is an image from a management challenge that the Northeast risk produced. And I'm sure one of my Northeast risk colleagues can drop a, a link to this into the chat. Management challenges are these one pagers. So like front and back digests of 30 to 50 articles from the literature or other resources where we really try to take really the essence of um, information and really distill it down to what was needed to know. And then sometimes we produce these really pretty pictures from it. So that's what you see here. Um, and you can see how climate change is exacerbating um, these impacts. So extremes are creating new opportunities for invasion. Herbicides are less effective. Invasives are becoming more competitive. We have new pathways. You'll hear about that later on in this session. Phenology is changing. And then, of course, I'm here to talk about the invasives shifting their ranges. So in response to this, we built the risk network and the Northeast risk aims to reduce the compounding effects of invasive species and climate change by synthesizing relevant science, communicating needs between managers and researchers, building stronger scientist manager communities, and conducting priority research. And we work off of a translational ecology model, which we have dubbed translational invasion ecology. And this is really from the beginning of the process of research, having everyone around the table that's invested to make sure ultimately we end with actionable science. So you can identify a problem first or identify your partners and practitioners and managers, stakeholders. Either way, you wanna be meeting, iteratively discussing your needs, identifying solutions. And different um, players at the table will then go out and do their respective um, actions, the, the things they can do based on their expertise, but then coming back together again iteratively, always sort of in communication. And then finally, you know, hoping to produce outcomes and outputs that are both useful to meeting the ultimate goals and also for the particular needs of the people. So, you know, academics might need journal articles or research scientists might need journal articles and managers might need, need BMPs and, and then iterating back again. So this is the model that the risks work in and um, the translational ecology to some extent is how the casks work as well. Okay, so that's the foundation. And why, do, why focus on range shifting species? Well, we know invasive species are a problem and we also know they're moving. Um, we know they're moving because species are gonna be responding to the changing um, climate and how um, their niches are shifting. Uh, and that change actually creates an opportunity because it means that these species are newly in an area. And so we're at kind of this early end of the invasion curve where you can really get more bang for your buck and you can put fewer resources into prevention or eradication than you can later on when things are really established. So here I have a definition for range shifting species and I'll note that there's a great work on terminology that can be referenced back to. Okay, so we know that species are range shifting also because there's been a lot of great work out of the Northeast so Jenica Allen, Bethany Bradley, and colleagues have modeled the shifts in risk from invasive species. And in particular, in the northeastern U.S., you can see it's very red, the idea being that it's going to be increasingly exposed to risk of invasive species. Basically, this is a more and more happy place to be 
any kind of plant, in this case, we're talking about plants. So also true to be ha a happier place for invasive plants. And this is based on modeling 900 uh, invasive plant species. So Jenica Allen has now made this work available through EdMaps. And so you can see the modeling results and look into the future and see the probability of increased risk in different counties across the Northeast and elsewhere. And this work was um, funded by the CASC and the Northeastern IPM Center. Another scholar, Annette Evans, with colleagues, has been looking not just at occupancy, just like whether they're there or not, but also abundance and really how that um, informs the impact of species. And so she's been modeling shifts in the center of the abundance range. So you can see, again, the Northeast is looking pretty bleak, but you can see that across the continental U.S., sort of how species are moving around. We take this primary research and then we digest it down into management challenges, like I said. So here's an example of a management challenge that took those hundreds of species and really used an impact assessment to say, okay, but here are the smaller subset that maybe managers can really focus on because they are both high impact and um, high vulnerability. And so um, these are all available at our website. Other risks have been doing these management challenges as well. We really try to hear from everyone, listen, take into account what is needed. And then we work really, really hard um, to do that work. And I'll say that we have a team of almost 20 people in the leadership of the Northeast Risk that meets an hour and a half a week. And we've been doing that for eight years. <laughs> so a lot of time has been put into trying to digest the latest research or even produce the latest research to help with management. Okay, so that's the invasive non-native species side. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about the potential nuisance neonative side. And so as an example, you can think about the southern pine beetles. So this is a major forest pest in the southeastern US and it's moving north. It's caused billions of dollars in timber losses. It's headed into Canada. This is modeling from Corey Lesk and Radley Horton and others through the Northeast cask, showing those sort of isoclines where the species will be shifting by year or decade north into other ecosystems. So this is a problem. We can think of the species as a nuisance neonative. I do want to make the point that from recent work that Bradley et al. and myself and others have put together, we looked at how species are rain shifting. And in blue, this is native rain shifters. And in red with the hash, this is the introduced. And you can see like there's the non-natives that are being spread around are moving much faster than native species. So this is much more of a concern on the rain shift side, but we can still think about how species are moving around. In fact, this is considered a conservation goal in climate adaptations for species to move around. There's lots and lots and lots of literature about increasing climate connectivity. And that's so species can move around and track their climate niche. So it's interesting to think about, okay, on the one hand, conservation of native species, being able to move around. On the other hand, management or even an attempted eradication of species moving around. And how do you choose? So we really tried to look at this and just using the lens of invasion biology to focus on species rain shifts and the potential nuisance, you know, species, native species moving around. And again, that's a management challenge that we have available. So there's a lot of frameworks around this. You can think about different traits like copper yield pressure, or biotic traits or abiotic traits as Catford and colleagues laid out that you can assess species. And then there's the ICAT, the environmental impact classification. You can actually classify a species and its impact as a massive, major, moderate, minor, or minimal. And so we suggest that you could use these existing tools for assessing non-native species and whether they're invasive and whether they should be considered really problematic and addressed. Also, in the same way you could address that, you could put through that filter native species. So we lay out this framework in our 2020 paper saying, okay, here's what you could think about and whether the species are high risk or low risk. So you could imagine a species that comes into a community and you know maybe it just slightly changes the diversity of the community. That's a minimal or minor impact, but all the way down to thinking about kind of taking over a whole community. So thinking about how rain shifts will affect communities is one way to think about it. Just to say there's implications for conservation and management with all of this and thinking about involving people from the beginning, identifying management priorities, 
incorporating SDM forecasts, using tools to assess the invasion risk, and monitoring changes. So go to the risk website, lots and lots of great information there. And you'll probably see me across these two days, but if you want to reach out, here's how you find me, and I'm happy to take questions, Bethany. Super. Thanks so much, Tony Lynn. We have a couple of questions related to the map. One of the maps that you showed that looked uh, at distributions of species and showed that there are some areas that are projected to have a loss of invasive species. One of the commenters noted that parts of California had projected negative numbers of invasive species. And so uh, there are sort of two different questions here. The first is, what does that mean having negative invasive species? And then the second one is, what are the implications of invasive species loss for conservation and adaptation? Awesome. Okay. Well, this is Bethany's work mostly, so I'll try to answer and you just shake your head if I'm saying it wrong. So part of it is that, like, if we think about Florida or some areas that are sort of to the south, if we're thinking about things like shifting northward, you're not going to capture those perfectly because of the way that we're modeling continentally, but that doesn't mean that there aren't other species that will be entering the new Florida and being very happy with that environment. So it's it partly in the way of what is there already. And so we're modeling to where it will go. But you can also imagine that there are deserts in the world that are not very friendly places for a lot of the tropical invasive species that we get here. And there's desertification happening in some of our more arid southwestern areas. So there's just places that are going to get less friendly for some of the plant biodiversity. And I think it's a great question to think about what it means for some of these empty niches and restoration opportunities, something we're thinking a lot about at the Northeast Risk. I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Bethany. <laughs> the only thing I would add is that we know of and have heard of many examples of invasive species becoming more problematic or expanding with climate change. And we haven't heard any examples of invasive species becoming less problematic or sort of disappearing with climate change yet. And I'd be really, I think we'd all be really eager to hear, <laughs> hear something about the latter, be it to, uh, not only because that would be great to know about, but also because that would help us understand whether that's a likely scenario uh, moving forward. I've got one other question for you, which I'm actually going to reinterpret. The question is actually about a specific species. So some of our panelists may know more about garlic mustard and that specific species and can answer that. Um, but I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about the these models that you've presented, distribution models, and how much do we trust those for any single given species in terms of these projections and forecasting? If I'm one space over from where a species is projected to expand, should I be worried? Yeah, great. So my son was modeling there <laughs> the uh, garlic mustard eradication we're trying in my backyard. Yeah, there's a lot of uncertainty with these models for a lot of reasons. And so pixel peeping, as some of my modeler colleagues like to call it, is not recommended. But I think these models give us an idea of the direction that things are moving and some generalizations and how we can think about decisions and objectives framing in the future. I think there's a lot to that. And I think we'll hear about that a lot in the next couple of days. And hopefully people can address that in their talks as they go. So thanks, everyone. Super. Thanks so much, Tony Lynn. Thanks so much to all of the speakers from this session. Uh, we really enjoyed all of the talks. And yeah, if everyone wants to give applause or emoji to thank all of the speakers, I think we are moving right over into the next session. So I'll turn it over from here to Dia Laurence. All right, just to get started, I want to thank everyone for sticking around. This is going to be a little bit different than the other kinds of presentations that we have. We're going to do a panel. My name's Dia Laurent, so I should introduce myself. I'm at Penn State University, formerly at University of Florida. I am apparently a rain shifter. We would like to thank you for joining our panel on invasive species management and prevention in a changing climate. Um, you know, this panel is sort of set up to show the importance of being able to adapt our approaches to management and prevention. So in this session, we'll discuss the work that's being done by the U.S. Invasive Species Advisory Committee, current approaches to prevention and early detection rapid response, and how we can adapt these uh, for climate change. Finally, a summary of a report from that um, Invasive Species Advisory Committee 
on how invasive species threaten the success of climate change adaptation efforts. And just allow me to introduce the panel. First, we'll hear from Lee Greenwood from the Nature Conservancy, and then I will give my little short presentation, and then Hillary Smith from Department of Interior, and finally, Laura Brewington um, from Arizona State University, also Pacific Risk, and Laura wins the prize for the most affiliations. So what we're going to do is give our short talks, and then once we're finished with that, we're going to have a, a, quite a chunk of time, hopefully, to answer your questions. So have them ready. Please enter those in the Q&A and not the chat. And to help me moderate the Q&A, try to keep the comments in there to a minimum. All right, with that, I'm going to hand it off to Lee Greenwood from the Nature Conservancy. I'm excited about this panel, and I wanted to start off as the first panelist giving a remarkably short presentation. So I'm going to do two slides only so that we can hand it down the line. Uh, so I'm the Forest Pest and Pathogen Program Director for the Nature Conservancy, which is part of our North America region. My responsibilities go across all different types of forest pests and pathogens that directly affect trees. So I put some gory photos on here so we could think about what sorts of pests and pathogens exist. We've got Balsamolia delgid, which is little tiny arthropod, emerald ash borer, very famous one, Asian longhorn beetle, a big charismatic megafauna beetle, all the way to polyphagus shot hole borer, which is an underappreciated threat, threat in the southwestern United States. And there's many, many more. So across all these different types of species, I work on forest pest and pathogen prevention of new species, management of existing species, and long-term resistant, but all of these things also have to be viewed through the perspective of climate change because it affects the effectiveness of all of our actions as well as the allocations of all of our resources across these different types of problems. So I was very happy to join the uh, Invasive Species Advisory Council, which is a body of non-federal invasive species experts um, that are brought in by the National Invasive Species Council, which is a body of federal invasive species experts, in order to provide cross counsel and advice and um, basically just new perspectives so that the federal government can see the bigger picture that the non-federal government looks at. And uh, this year we had a subcommittee within the Invasive Species Advisory Committee uh, Council on invasive species and climate change. So that's why I'm here giving this uh, conversation about how they interact. And we were tasked by the National Invasive Species Council to consider executive order um, tackling the climate crisis at home and abroad and how invasive species intersect and interact with that executive order. And it's um, very important to note that when we tackle this, our subcommittee started off with acknowledging that there's four different ways that climate change and invasive species interact. And the regional invasive species and climate change groups that have come together to convene this particular webinar acknowledge all four of these ways. But for us to write an advisory document to the federal government as non-federal participants, it was too much to tackle. It was too much to think about all at once. And it certainly would not have been an impactful paper because this is all information that could be gathered from other experts. So we decided to focus on a singular piece, which is this bottom piece about how invasive species reduce the resilience of ecosystems and communities to climate change, whether that's adaptation or mitigation. And so later on, you're going to hear from another member of the Invasive Species Advisory Council, Laura, and she's going to dig into what specific recommendations only within that piece of the interaction pie we put within the documentation that was adopted in November, but actually is anticipated to be published on the federal documentation in the next uh, week or three, possibly, depending on layout and so forth. So with that, I'm going to hand it to the next person, which is Dia. All right, I'm back again. So just shifting gears a bit, 
I'm going to talk to you about horizon scanning as a way to identify potential threats, invasive species threats. I'm an invasion ecologist that specializes in prevention and uh, management prioritization. And horizon scanning is this method to process large amounts of information and use that to identify threats or, you know, opportunities. It's been applied more recently to specifically identify invasive species threats. In 2014, Helen Roy, one of our plenary speakers tomorrow, published the first horizon scan on identifying invasive species threats to the UK. I saw her speak in Ireland, I believe in 2018, and saw a presentation on this method and, you know, ask her, is anyone doing this in the United States, to her knowledge? And the answer was no. So I talked to her a lot about it and studied the, the methods and got some funding and did the first one in the U.S. for Florida. And when we did the Florida scan, what we wanted to do was provide a ranked list of invasive species threats, identify their pathways for arrival, and then categorize their impacts and impact mechanisms. So you have the what and the how, and then the consequences. And this is a figure from that 2014 paper that sort of breaks down the process. So up here in the phase one, you'll have the task to identify your scope, assemble your team of experts and develop a list. So in terms of scope here, you'll see it's kind of tiny, but um, each of those arrows that are stacked is a different taxonomic group. So you can do a scan for, you know, plants and vertebrates, vertebrates, dividing it, it that way. Or we have completed organisms in trade horizon scan for just vertebrates. And we have one for just plants and one for invertebrates in process. So that's where you want to identify your scope. Um, assembling your team of experts, you really want to make sure that you get a wide breadth of expertise because that's where it really comes in uh, handy at the end. Um, and the hardest part really is developing that list because you're trying to identify the unknown. And there are a bunch of really great sites and resources to pull species lists. And what you want to do is pull the, the species that are not in your area of concern or your area at risk. Um, and and for the most part, looking for species that have an, a history of invasiveness or naturalization. Then we do rapid risk assessment, peer review, and we build consensus within our groups. Next, we want to assemble those into a master list where we, as a group, review and refine. And this is where we maximize that expert knowledge and opinion. And then finally, we want to build our consensus. So at the end of the day, we all get together and vote on those ranking. So in terms of how we do our assessments, if you're familiar with risk assessment, the majority of the full risk assessments take anywhere from hours to weeks, depending on how detailed they are. This is supposed to be much more rapid. So somewhere around an hour, hour and a half for each. And we evaluate the likelihood of arrival on a scale of one to five, likelihood of establishment and spread and magnitude of impact. Um, we added this feasibility of management for the Puerto Rico and U.S. Virgin Island scan um, just as a tester to see if it really helps us with our rankings. Um, and then we also categorize our pathways for arrival. Um, so these photos here just show some examples. We use the um, Convention of Biological Diversity um, framework for pathways. So you see an intentional release of a goldfish, hole fouling, and then this flatworm is you know, the, known to get moved around in uh, nursery material. We also, when we get to the end, at least in the scans that I've worked on, really dig in on those impacts and, and categorize those so that um, we can give a full report to the powers that be, the decision makers. So currently we're working on organisms in trade, as I mentioned in this Puerto Rico, U.S. Virgin Island scan, which is all taxa. As soon as the funding comes in, we're going to be starting a project on pathways, looking specifically at secondary pathways for spread. In discussions with some of my collaborators, uh, Susan Canavan and I work very closely on a lot of this stuff, Wes Daniel at USGS, 
and others, we've been discussing ways to innovate and simplify our process. So through coding, folks in Fort Collins have done some great work developing script to just process our list more efficiently, do some climate matching. Looking into modifying the process to try to identify the sleeper species and rain shifters and specific species that might arrive due to climate change. And then as a new faculty member at Penn State, I'm building my research uh, program. And one of those things I'd like to get into is a comprehensive review of the scanning methods, uh, how we score, how we think about uncertainty, and research to look into data mining to see if we're catching those surprises. So would the scan catch a Juro spider, for example? And I'll just show this before I pass off. The stages of, of invasion are presented here in the green. And in the purple over on the end here, you see this inverse relationship between management costs and efficiency. And for this reason, we want to stay up in that prevention area before they are released. And that's where I try to stay. But the next best, best thing is to get into the early de detection and rapid response, which the list that we create with our horizon scans can help inform. And so with that, I'm going to pass it off to Hillary. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the invitation to be a part of this panel. I'm with the Department of the Interior, and I want to acknowledge that I'm just sharing information about the National Early Detection and Rapid Response Framework on behalf of a large team of us that are working to advance this work. So for those of you who may not be familiar with the Department of the Interior, we are one of 15 departments across the executive branch, and we have a broad and diverse mission, which is to protect and manage the nation's natural resources and cultural heritage, to provide scientific and other information about those resources, and to honor trust responsibilities or special commitments to American Indians, Alaska Native, Native Hawaiians, and affiliated island communities. So across the department, we have more than 10 different agencies, or what we refer to them as bureaus, and those logos are shown on this slide. So those are all under the Department of Interior, and they have their own missions and authorities as well. And we have identified invasive species management as a cross-cutting priority. And we regularly coordinate not only across these agencies, but also across the federal government and, our, and with our non-federal partners. So why is focusing on early detection and rapid response so important? And we've already heard this uh, iterated today, which is that there are studies that are estimating the cost of biological invasions, um, that they exceed over $400 billion. And you'll hear a little bit more from the authors of this report uh, tomorrow. So well-established species are complex, costly to manage, and sometimes those impacts are uh, in perpetuity. So our focus on the national EDRR framework is really to focus earlier on that in invasion curve where there is opportunity to uh, prevent those long-term impacts. And we define EDRR as finding a founding population uh, early and then implementing eradication efforts to rapidly remove them before they have a chance to establish spread and cause harm. And as Lee mentioned earlier in the panel, we do see invasive species EDRR efforts as a really important opportunity to not only boost climate resilience, but also to protect our investments that we're making in natural uh, nature-based solutions and other restoration and resilience efforts. There have been uh, many calls for a national early detection and rapid response framework uh, especially for non-agricultural systems, because there are great systems in place through USDA to respond to emergency situations for agricultural pests. So this effort is really focused on those non-agricultural systems where there are gaps and there isn't as well established a national system. So we see calls for such a framework in agency plans, department level plans, interagency plans, and we also see it supported in the scientific literature. We know that uh, this is not a single agency effort, and so Interior is committed to working across the federal family and with our non-federal partners to move this framework forward. But to help clarify the purpose of a national early detection and rapid response framework, we have a, a draft mission statement, which is to find and eradicate invasive species new to the United States or those demonstrating secondary spread by coordinating across federal and non-federal partners and investing in innovative approaches for surveillance, data integration, and response capabilities for natural resource management. So the mission statement says, 
what we want to accomplish with the framework. The framework itself shows how we will accomplish that. And so this figure on the left shows all the different action steps that we envision as part of an EDRR workflow. And it's essentially a sequence of coordinated and strategic actions that focuses capacity investments on the right species, the right time, the right place, with the right tool. And so essentially these EDRR actions can be applied at any scale national, regional, state, local, et cetera. And so when we talk about the EDRR framework, we're really kind of talking about two things. One is this system or this process, these action steps of early detection and rapid response. And we're also talking about this set of projects that are coordinated at a national level, um, initially here through the Department of Interior to advance a framework. So for this slide, two things I wanna point out. In the upper left is a simpler diagram that shows that EDRR workflow, essentially boiling it down to four action steps, planning and all the associated steps, detection, reporting, and response actions. And then that larger figure again shows those different action steps that we are investing in. And so in the boxes, what you see there are DOI's contributions to advancing a national EDR framework. The idea here is that we're building on decision support tools and uh, detection tools. So the horizon scanning work that DL mentioned, as well as a lot of other decision support work in progress and trying to move this work forward in a very comprehensive way so that we're not just investing in one or two projects, but a whole suite of projects that are complementary and again, connected at a national level. And I want to acknowledge the resources to move forward this work is the bipartisan infrastructure law, which passed a few years ago and provides historic uh, un unseen really uh, levels of funding to move forward a, a whole set of work, uh, not just on ecological re restoration and invasive species. So I will also note that this is just a start. We recognize that there is more work to do uh, within interior and across our federal partners and non-federal community. Uh, and so just to summarize what we envision the benefits of a framework uh, achieving is to provide invasive species manager access to uh, tools and technology to help with prioritization uh, and doing so with efficient means, providing ready access to EDRR information in such a way that uh, can inform strategic decision making with limited resources providing access to rapid response funding, such as through the Aquatic Invasive Species Pilot Rapid Response Fund, again, to help expedite on the ground action for high priority species, to boost surveillance and response capacity so that we can move forward collective action, again, focusing on those right species at the right time in the right place with the right tool, and ultimately helping to connect a national network to leverage expertise and resources on early detection and rapid response. So with that, I'll turn it over uh, to Laura. Awesome. Thanks, Hillary. Thanks, Dia, for organizing this panel. Aloha, good morning or afternoon or night, whatever it might be where you are. Like Dia said earlier, I do wear a lot of hats. Um, I win the affiliation contest, but um, I'm normally based in Honolulu, Hawaii, uh, where I'm a research professor at ASU and research fellow at East West Center. I'm also the co-director for NOAA's Climate Adaptation Partnership Program for the U.S. Pacific Islands region. Uh, we're called the Pacific Research on Island Solutions for Adaptation, or Pacific RESA, um, and our team leads climate adaptation research across um, this sort of vast region that you see on the right hand um, side of the slide. I'm also one of the co-founders of the Pacific Risk Team that covers the same enormous area. Um, and like Lee, I am a member of the U.S. Invasive Species Advisory Committee and worked with her last year on the subcommittee that was focused on climate change and invasive species, which is what I'll be talking about today. So I'm going to just revisit um, the ISAC white paper that Lee mentioned on climate change and invasive species, which um, hopefully, as you remember, um, focused on just one aspect of the intersection between these two threats. And that's how invasive species can actually reduce the resilience of ecosystems and communities to the impacts of climate change. And in particular, the ISAC subcommittee, we generated five key recommendations for federal agencies and for departments that will hopefully enable them to better integrate climate change and invasive species issues in their plans and their procedures and their policies. So to do this, our white paper really hinged on doing a gap analysis of the federal climate adaptation plans, which as you remember from Lee's comments earlier, those were part of a requirement of Executive Order 14008, tackling the climate crisis at home and abroad. 
So like I say, as a starting point, we conducted this gap analysis to try to identify priority areas or themes where the federal climate adaptation plans were inconsistent or inadequate around invasive species issues. Our subcommittee reviewed 26 climate adaptation plans that came from federal departments and bureaus like USDA, Department of Interior, USAID, Department of State, Department of Commerce, Homeland Security, EPA, NASA, so on. If you too would like to review these plans, most of them can be found on um, sustainability.gov. And of the plans that we reviewed, only eight of them directly referenced invasive species, and of those eight, only four meaningfully connected invasive species to the United States' preparedness and resilience to climate impacts. I want to reiterate here that these are national level plans. The ISAC works at the federal level, so we did not review state or local agency plans, and those, of course, might more closely tie invasive species and climate change. But this gap analysis really helped us develop the five recommendations that you see on the left hand side of the slide. And while I don't have time to go into all of them in great detail, I do want to focus on recommendation one, which simply states that invasive species must be considered as a component of climate adaptation planning and processes. How this will be accomplished depends on the mandates and the capabilities of each agency and bureau and department. But we identified three sort of high level common action themes that were across all of the plans as a starting point for them to think about. So I'll just quickly go through these three themes. Almost all of the plans emphasized a need for better climate literacy, for more data and tools, and for improved communication about climate change and risk. Remember, these are climate adaptation plans, so they're focused on climate. And so we recommended as the ISAC that agencies also invest in research that directly incorporates invasive species impacts at the relevant scales into their climate information products and actionable management tools so that they stay ahead of the curve um, when there is an invasion on the horizon or already in process. This also could help ensure that research outcomes and products are accessible by the relevant federal personnel, the general public, and the education community. Our second common theme, not surprisingly, under the current administration, was infrastructure. And it's undeniable at this point that invasive species can reduce the resilience of both built and natural infrastructure to withstand climate change and disaster events and you know the horrific wildfires that were fueled by invasive grass in Maui last year surely erased any lingering doubts about that. Um, so long-term infrastructure planning and disaster response, uh, we argued in this paper, have to both consider and actively manage for invasive species threats. And finally, we really wanted to point out that the effectiveness and the efficiency of transportation and supply chains by air, by sea, by land can all be disrupted by invasive species transport or by spread, yet again, underscoring the importance of early detection and rapid response that Hillary just presented. And so we use these three common themes um, that I just outlined to go back to our federal agency partners and identify the steps that could be taken through funding mechanisms, through policy frameworks, or through capacity building, you know, whatever they're capable of. And these recommendations also made it into the paper. So like Lee said in the beginning, uh, we do wish that the paper were available online right now um, that we could link to you guys, but it will be published on invasivespecies.gov as an ISAC white paper soon. And our subcommittee team is also currently formatting it into a journal publication to submit for peer review. Um, so I will stop there and hand it back to Dia for questions. All right. So... Just a reminder who you're talking to. <laughs> so now we're going to answer some questions. Please don't be shy and place your questions in the Q&A. I'm going to stop the share for now so you can see our faces. And let me see what I have here. For the National EDRR, I'm working in Hawaii where I've been doing early detection of invasive plants and have found many problematic invaders. But the local invasive species committee largely lacks the resources to manage or eradicate many of the plants I've found. How can a national EDRR response help towards eradication of these already identified invasives? Thank you, Kevin, for that question. And it's one that we're continuing to explore in collaboration with our state partners who are doing a lot of great work um, together as well with our tribal and territorial leaders in this space. Uh, one of the initial resources that's available, and I mentioned this already in the chat for another question about 
at least funding that might be available is specifically this pilot program for aquatic invasive species for newly detected aquatic invasive. So essentially what we're trying to do through the framework is focus on those species that are new to the United States and also those that are demonstrating secondary spread. And the intent here is to help complement programs that are already in place and operating um, at these other levels. And as you point out, we're well aware that in many cases, these two are also under uh, resourced. Yet we're also hoping to help focus um, how we can prioritize these limited dollars. So again, the Rapid Response Fund right now is a pilot program just for aquatic invasive species. And we'll be exploring across the federal family how we can, if we can, offer something similar in the future for those non-aquatic invaders. We also are looking to help provide access to informational resources um, on EDRR. And this is through an online information hub called SIREN the National EDRR Information System, which is just being built now. And that is also envisioned to help pull together information about technical support that might be available, uh, expertise that might be able to be enlisted, and potentially other funding sources that could be available. So I think we're at the beginning now of working through one of the groups that um, Lee and Laura already mentioned, the Invasive Species Advisory Committee and the Aquatic Nuisance and Species Task Force to um, better understand how the framework can address the variety of needs that states and others have for EDRR. Great. Just a real quick, there's a question asking to clarify management costs is the inverse of efficiency. Sorry, I went over that pretty quickly in my talk. That was just the inverse of, you know, cost versus efficiency. So as the efficiency goes down, the cost goes up. And we have another question here for the group. What makes you optimistic about this dreary and depressing area of study work? How do we keep going when it's so sometimes just so bleak? I think this is a great example. This forum is just incredible, right? We had over 1,700 people register. We had 700 at least join today at one point or the other and knowing that we're all in this together I think is really at least personally helps to keep me going day to day and working with all of you and our colleagues that extend beyond even those that are here today and this idea of coalition building the collaboration the coordination the boots on the ground uh, is really also important I think for our work and then I think lastly, I would mention, and, and this came up already today about communicating the successes and telling our story and, and also focusing on those easy wins. A lot of what we work on are really long-term challenges and we also need to reward ourselves for those things that we can get done in the near term and celebrate those successes. I can add too to what Hillary said is that, you know, we're moving at a very rapid rate for scientific advances. There's a lot of really, really interesting breakthroughs in surveillance technologies, in adaptive management, biocontrol, and the breeding of resistant uh, species for invasive species impacts as well as for climate change impacts. And so while science takes time and money and absolutely doesn't fix every problem, it's also a really exciting time to be working in the intersection of invasive species and climate change, because we are seeing more concrete solutions emerging just from the advancement of, of scientific tools in general. And part of that is, you know, investment and part of that is federal investment. And then part of it is also the increasing awareness of the necessity of those tools so private sector, as well as partnership and coalition building, like Hillary mentioned. Yeah, I'll jump in here, too, and just reiterate um, the idea of redefining success, celebrating wins, not wallowing in looking at you know, the biodiversity loss in the Everglades to Burmese python, for example. I'd also like to mention that groups like the Regional Invasive Species and Climate Change um, Networks, I think that kind of coordination, the cross-boundary coordination, you know, we have our little individual groups, regional groups, but we meet regularly. And I think feeding off of one another, sharing information, the approach that the risk networks take has really I think it's shortened the amount of time it takes to get published research translated to the community. So I think that's a really big win for what's been happening, at least in my experience, the last few years. 
Yeah, maybe I'll use this opportunity you know, to, again, make a shameless plug for advocating for support for your local risk group and for expanding our networks. Because one of the things that you know the ISAC comes back to again and again when we were having our discussions around this white paper, which, by the way, to the question of where it will be published, I answered that in the chat, so it should be under the answered questions list. But in our ISAC paper on climate change, really we kept coming back to the, the question of how can we better inform managers and stakeholders about the intersection between climate change and invasive species and these kind of emerging and accelerating solutions that are out there and how can we you know improve knowledge transfer and you know again and again regional groups like the risk kept coming up as trusted sources for information so support your risks from wherever you can and uh, I think this symposium like Hillary said in the beginning is one of the best um, ways to stay positive in, you know, what is sometimes bleak, but I think also a really hopeful space to work in. Yeah, and I can piggyback off of that for uh, another question. I was asked specifically about my opinion about the creation of PRISMs, um, which forgive me for not remembering what that acronym stands for. Um, I'm I, Coming from Florida, we had SISMAs, which were cooperative um, invasive species management areas. I'll, I'll answer that more broadly. I think that the PRISMs, the SISMAs, those also fit into this kind of idea of information sharing and teaming up to solve problems. So I hope they get that off the ground here in Pennsylvania. And I think it would be great uh, if that could happen in every state. So then we can start having regional meetings between the PRISMs and the SISMAs to continue that collaboration. I had a question here about what collaborative strategies can be implemented internationally to effectively tackle the challenges posed by climate change and invasive species. So, you know, this is an inter international conference. We were very much U.S. centric. So how, how do we do, scale this out and work internationally? Um, that's a space that I've been trying to really focus a lot of attention on because the entrance of invasive species, in my case, forest pests and pathogens into the continent of North America is really the most important point of intervention. And for plant pests, and like forest pests, there is an actual body, the IPPC, International Plant Protection Convention, that governs the movement of a lot of the different materials that are pathways that commonly move plant pests. And so understanding these international bodies, which are often, but not always part of the UN's incredibly complicated structure, um, understanding them and understanding who your representative within the federal government is and what sorts of information they need to hear from you that their work is important and you are talking about their work and you want them to do the best possible job to protect whatever it is that your work protects, I think is really the way that we all need to get started on international protection. When I try to work on these issues, you know, I work with USDA APHIS, Animal Plant and Health Inspection Service, and Customs and Border Protections, Agricultural Interdiction Services, because those are the people doing the hard work on the ground to protect from international movement. But for somebody who's doing aquatics, it would be a different piece of the federal government. So orienting yourself into that space of who does this important work and how can you help them do it better, I think is really important for everybody on, the, on this webinar. And just to add to that, I think with respect to the federal government, the National Invasive Species Council housed here at the Department of the Interior represent a, a kind of coordinating a whole of government approach across uh, the federal family and uh, also with our non-federal partners. So they are a great resource and there's information online uh, on their website about their work and their membership, et cetera. And they also help to provide a great uh, liaison to the international community. I would also mention that there are other forum um, that we've been heavily involved in uh, that are relevant to not just invasive species, but more broadly across the conservation community. So for example, we do have a lot of trilateral engagement with Mexico and Canada um, through the Trilateral Committee for Wildlife and Ecosystem Conservation and Management. There's also the North American Invasive Species Forum, which used to be called the Weeds Across Borders Forum, again, to promote that trilateral uh, collaboration. And then within our nonprofit organizations, the North American Invasive Species Management Association, who is helping to host this forum, also helps to connect those 
experts beyond just the United States. And then maybe Laura, I'll turn over to you. You have great affiliations as well throughout the Pacific and beyond on an international space that maybe you can speak to. Yeah, no, thanks, Hillary. Having the perspective from the federal government too in the United States is so important and understanding kind of where it's looking internally and outward thinking for that whole government approach. I also, I don't know if it's, already been published online, but I think it's chapter six from the 2023 IPBES report, the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services um, report is specifically about um, international um, coordination and implementation around invasive species. Um, with respect to kind of climate issues, um, NOAA's strategy for stony coral tissue loss disease uh, um, is a, kind of an international strategic prioritization uh, with clearly defined research questions with aims and objectives and coordination among the different research teams from the Caribbean um, in the United States and then onwards to the Pacific Islands region, which is where the disease has not, as we know of, um, yet currently reached. Um, but we're very fearful that with uh, maritime trade, and recreational transport that it will reach the Pacific um, Islands region and affect our coral reefs. And so that's one, I think, really good example of kind of the international implementation um, and coordination efforts um, and kind of within that scope. You know, I know that there are at a very high level ballast water regulations, for example, to prevent the movement of invasive species and especially with um, changing transport um, under climate change, that becomes even more critical. And then regionally within the U.S. Pacific Islands region, which is an international region, we have strategies like the Regional Biosecurity Plan for Micronesia and Hawaii, which was commissioned by the U.S. Navy about 10 years ago, but is this 2,000-page comprehensive framework for collaboration across these jurisdictions that are, you know, some of them in the United States, some of them are regional partners and territories, and then some of them are independent countries. So just really interesting um, frameworks that I think we can build off of as great examples. Yeah, I think in the U.S. itself, there's been a big call for kind of getting on the same page for even listing species. I know in the invasive plant council world, we're trying to do that. So I think the work we've done with the terminology, trying to speak the same language, I think that kind of I think that translates across international borders as well. OK, we have a couple more questions. Somebody give me the hook if we're approaching time. But this question is from Paul. How might managers balance waiting for the promise of cutting edge management tools with considerations to accept some invasions as a part of the resist, accept direct model due to compounding effects of climate change on native ecosystem. I mean, that's a tough one, but I'll give an example of, of work that I've done. So I'm familiar with the example. You know, it's really important for everybody to know not to move firewood. And moving firewood is one of the big ways that forest pests are moved around North America once they've been introduced. Even though we are working on cutting edge techniques for um, the application of biological control to control emerald ash borer and resistance breeding to bring in resistant strains of ash trees, it's still incredibly important to stick to the basics, not to move firewood. Because when you don't move these pests faster, you buy different ecoregions, different managers, time and money, and the ability to focus on threats right in front of them instead of you know, waves of threats crashing upon them. So we have to do both the basic prevention of secondary spread in order to give that science the time to get caught up and in order to give people the ability to approach the issues right in their laps with money and with energy and with know-how and not be facing additional more and more because when you do have so many invasive species coming at you, um, I, all, I don't live in Florida, that's for darn sure, but I feel like this is what it would feel like to be in Florida. So many invasive species coming at you that you're in a constant state of triage. That is a lot less productive than if you actually had the ability to focus on your highest priorities on a daily basis. So I think it's some of sticking to the basics and not relying on the latest science is important to hybridize with the idea of looking forward towards the future of scientific solutions to the problems at hand. Anyone else? We've got a couple more questions I can move to. 
I like this one. <laughs> Uh, from Annie Simpson, I'm struck by the fact that the vast majority of this conference's presenters, at least today, are women. Are women perhaps more willing to continue to work on daunting problems like invasive species and climate change than are men? <laughs> there might be a, a, a bit of a, what is it, selection bias <laughs> that could have <laughs> happened as we were pulling people together, but I'll let the panelists weigh in if our response is gendered. <laughs> My program um, is almost entirely like the core team is staffed by women. And someone, someone once was like, do you not hire men to, to avoid hiring men? But I, you know, I was going to grad school. There were very few kind of interdisciplinary programs. And I feel like climate change, and especially climate change and invasive species intersecting um, is very interdisciplinary. And I was attracted to that. And I found that a lot of my um, female fellow cohort graduate students also were just really interested in these kind of trans disciplinary transboundary issues. Um, so that's always been my answer. It's like, perhaps there's, you know, some degree of, you know, self-selection for cross-cutting maybe issues that don't sit necessarily in their typical disciplinary silos. And I was just going to say, hello, Annie. It's great to see your name pop up in the chat. I uh, hope you are doing well and glad that you're listening in. And I would just say again, yeah, it takes a village and I'm glad we're all part of it. All right, next question. There are many steps involved in the EDRR framework, Hillary. Mm -hmm. Do you provide more information on the support that this push is hoping to provide to managers making context-specific decisions about what rapid response actions are the best use of their limited resources? If I'm understanding the question correctly, the idea here would be that um, SIREN, this online information hub, the National EDRR Information System, some of you may, hopefully, you've been involved in some of the um, community practices and advisor groups that have set up to help inform the utility of this uh, information hub. But that is intended to help pull together this information for easy access um, for invasive species managers. The National Invasive Species Council also has a great effort in um, process by Angela McMillan Brannigan, and I think Dia and others have been involved in this in terms of helping to summarize and explain how all of these diff different decision support tools, horizon scanning, can be used to help managers with priorities, the priority setting, and we see that as a great resource as well. So Dia, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit more about that. Uh, I have a research extension split, so if you're not familiar with what extension is, at land, land uh, grant institutions um, extension, my teaching appointment is basically to translate uh, science to the greater community. And so I've done a lot of talks, and some to the to NISC and, and elsewhere on more detailed on horizon scanning so folks can understand um, exactly what it involves and what the goals are. Um, and I still get the pushback, well, you didn't include you know, pythons in the Florida scanner. It's like, no, 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 we're trying to predict what isn't here yet. So I do a lot of that kind of work in thinking about tools and more broadly thinking about how to modify some of the tools that we're already using, like that rapid risk assessment to prioritize EDRR decision-making. It's very easily tweaked and rewritten for folks to folks on the ground to be able to fill those out. So it's not all academic speak. So that more broadly, that's kind of what I do in terms of making this kind of information accessible to the folks that need it. Okay. Next question is, even in our national parks, the decision makers don't take invasives as all that serious a problem. Construction projects that will result in massive increases in invasive plants get very little priority in knocking back the weeds. A lot of resistance to utilizing new technology to help fight the problem. So this is more of a comment than a question. <laughs> a lot of decision makers seem woefully behind in their wanting to tackle these difficult issues. Um, does anybody want to speak towards that? I have a positive for that one that I wanted to start with, which is I know that our friends at NASMA have this really interesting program that they developed for just this sort of scenario of construction and how it can move invasive species around. And it's modeled after Play Clean Go, but it's called Work Clean Go. And I think the fact that there's a whole program dedicated to making sure that issues like invasive species moved on construction equipment and other working environments being launched really speaks to how we're growing awareness of these issues. So even though there certainly might be some 
national park units that have higher priorities that lay elsewhere. There is also a lot of really positive movement in terms of making sure that these sorts of high level prevention efforts also reach into things like construction infrastructure, like we focused on in the ISAC paper, making sure that infrastructure is ready for both climate change and invasive species impacts. We've got a lot of forward progress in these areas. Of course, um, with forward progress, sometimes there's imperfection. And I would just add, I think that's a great comment for our Park Service colleagues, and in fact, all of our interior colleagues. We do have a departmental policy on invasive species management. And if you're not aware of that, I hope um, reach out to me. I'm happy to send it to you because it does provide uh, policy grounding in prevention and actually doing equipment cleaning, et cetera. So we do have language in there as well to the extent possible to have it in agreement language, et cetera, to help bolster the work that we're trying to achieve on the ground. And I would also just note again that you know my role, again, with my colleagues across the National Invasive Species Council, together with all of your help is that's the, the audience that we're trying to um, influence and, and collaborate with uh, our decision makers. And it's the role that Leah and Laura play on the Invasive Species Advisory Committee and others are, really play essential um, roles in helping to uh, inform our decision makers and, and hear from them too about how we can be more effective in messaging and integrating this into an interdisciplinary approach rather than just a siloed approach. So I think there are lots of great opportunities to help uh, influence decision makers at all levels of government in which we all work. But that's just a, a little bit of a perspective from the federal government. Yeah, maybe just a last comment on that. The question disappeared from my view, so I can't read it again. But one of the things that we do in the climate adaptation space is peer-to-peer -peer exchange. And so just kind of thinking about on-the-ground solutions for the kind of knowledge transfer and how, you know, one national park could learn from another national park's experience across the nation, kind of facilitating that, those communication efforts and knowledge transfer is one of the main recommendations that's coming out of our white paper as well. So for places that, you know, may not have used a technology before or may not even know it's available or new data sources, I think just opening those lines um, of exchange is a really great tool for people to, to learn and to learn from the experiences of others. Excellent. So with that, I think we're at about time. I want to thank my co-panelists. This was great. I've learned stuff as well as I uh, got to present. So I appreciate it. And now we are going to shift. So this is an inaugural meeting. So we're going to have an inaugural award. This year, we're giving a community action award to Lee Greenwood. Just a little description of what we were thinking about when developing this award. Um, the award is given to a member of the management and or research community in recognition of their contributions to invasive species and climate change efforts. This year, we're presenting this award to Lee Greenwood of the Nature Conservancy for her work on forest health, management of introduction pathways, service on the Invasive Species Advisory Committee, and her efforts to change problematic common names. Lee is the director of the Nature Conservancy's Forest Pest and Pathogen Program, which sits within the North America Natural Climate Solutions team. Lee works to bring stakeholders together to achieve common goals in support of forest health from the forest pest and pathogen perspective. Her projects include managing the Don't Move Firewood campaign, convening the Continental Dialogue on Non-Native Forest Insects and Diseases, working to improve the international biosecurity measures in place for solid wood packaging, and leading the partnership efforts to accelerate the development of pest and pathogen resistant native trees. Lee's leadership of the Don't Move Firewood campaign has led to its being widely regarded as one of the most innovative public outreach arms of the Nature Conservancy. Her publications cover topics ranging broadly from human behavior change campaigns to regulatory gap analysis. Lee's work has a practical focus. Her priority is to use social science and database decision making to determine what feasible actions can most efficiently bring forth greater protections to forest health. Lee also has helped petition the Entomological Society of America to change the common name of Lymantra dispar to spongy moth, a change that, that has removed the former name, which was a pejorative term for the Romani people, Europe's largest ethnic minority group. I've sat in on many calls with Lee on this topic, and I have a deep respect for her passion for correcting these problematic names. 
So on behalf of the co-organizers of the Invasive Species Climate Change Conference and the Regional Invasive Species and Climate Change Management Network, I'm happy to present this Community Action Award to Lee. The floor is yours, Lee, if you want to say a couple of words. Thanks, Tia. It's kind of a unique experience to receive an award from in my house because this is an international virtual climate uh, change and invasive species conference. But uh, I'm super grateful. And I wanted to turn around and thank everybody I work with because obviously everything we do is a partnership effort, whether it's spending years figuring out how to rename a moth or traveling around the world to make sure that the global community is aware of the importance of preventing the movement of invasive species. But I think one of the things that I appreciate the most about all the work we do is that the people trust us. People trust groups like this one and like the work that we do in order to protect the things that are most important to them, whether that's resources or a single species or the, the land that they own. And so I really appreciate um, the trust put in all of us to get the work done and do our best um, every day. So thank you very much, Dia. All right, everybody give her a round of applause with the claps. I see a lot of love in the corner. And I'm going to go like buy myself a chocolate bar or something so that I can really, you know, lean into this moment. So everybody knows I will celebrate for sure. All right. All right, now I'm gonna pass it back to Elliot uh, to round out the day. So welcome to the day one ISC wrap up. I've just got a couple things to say. First of all, you all called in from all over the world, which is just fantastic. It's so great to see so many people from all over. This is a map of the Mentipole and please fill that out if you haven't, let us know where you're calling in from. A huge thank you to all of our speakers, to our moderators, to the session organizers, the conference organizers. The speakers gave us some amazing things to think about and questions and ideas and inspiration. In particular, starting off with our first talk by Dr. Grentz, a lot about relationality and very inspiring words. To our next, Dr. Hellman, who had some very interesting questions for us to think about, in particular, this, this figure showing how important it is to consider different stakeholders in terms of what they think, what they value. A few notable quotes from today. Don't go to sleep on the echinoderms. That was a good one. Pay attention to the context. That was a super important message from a few of our speakers. Field trials are not enough. You've got to swing through we are bunting, and it's been so long since I've seen a baseball game, I had to look that up. Who gets to decide the value of species? A really important question for us all to think about. Not all cases of managed relocation are the same. We need to pay attention to particular contexts, particular species, and their particular niches, their needs. We heard a lot of terms and concepts today. Um, food for thought, especially how which words we use and how we should use them. There were a lot of logos shared indicating just how many groups, how many agencies and organizations are all working together on these issues. There were a lot of resources shared that will be working to consolidate after the ISC is finished to try to get the listservs, those links to what was brought up during today and tomorrow. There were a lot of tools shared, tools that are super useful from EdMaps, to the Resist Accept Direct Framework, ICAT, Horizon Scanning, definitely tools that are worth pursuing and checking out. Frameworks, definitely super important in terms of our understanding of how climate is affecting invasive species. We'll try to share out as well afterwards on these different frameworks that are available so you can download those and use them, incorporate them into your work. There are a lot of articles, white papers mentioned, a lot of great research is, is happening, but there are a lot of gaps and a lot more research needs to be done, as was pointed out today. Uh, of course, there were equations that were offered, um, and it's complicated, right? How climate change affects invasive species is very complicated, as has been shown by a number of research projects and publications the last few years. Really highlighting the importance of us all getting together to, to talk about these and share knowledge and what has been learned so those successful approaches can be shared around. 
just a quick snapshot for tomorrow. So we will see you all there tomorrow for our day two and final day of the inaugural ISC. We'll start with a, a welcome back and plenary. And then our sessions will include management success stories, managing invasive species in a changing climate. We'll have an audience participation section, crowdsourcing the future, some emerging research lightning talks to share with everybody. And then we'll be finishing it off with closing remarks. So thank you so much again, everyone for attending, for your participation. And we look forward to seeing you tomorrow.